Kicking off the list at number 10, an arming squire. Being a knight, okay, obviously this sounds cool on paper. They have the sword, they have the horse, the flowing lady, the gal on the back of said horse. They're saving the damsel in distress or something, right? Sometimes they lose a hand like Jamie Lannister, but that's just what being a knight is all about, right? Also, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen Game of Thrones nine years ago. It wasn't always a fairy tale epic being a knight. First of all, this process starts when you're seven years old as well. So you would be given to a noble to learn for seven years, and then at age 14, you became a squire. Ah, yes, a noble squire. We've heard this term before. What do they do? Uh, well, it's, it's a knight's intern. Yeah, not an ideal job to have when you're young, but it's a job nonetheless. Also, you had no choice, so you, you had to do it. Welcome to the Middle Ages. Arming squires, they had a lot of responsibility. Arming squires would repair a knight's armor while they were still wearing it. Yeah, how fun is that? Oh, which buckle was it? Ah, uh, yes, that one. Mm. Yeah, fixing up chain mail on a grown man's thigh. Not ideal, welcome to the Dark Ages. Pretty dark. Also, after these epic, messy battles, arming squires would have to clean everything off of their armor. Yeah, everything. A lot of yuck going on in that business day. This was long before Dawn soap was also a thing, so they had to clean with urine. Yeah, gross, so gross, it gets worse and worse. Welcome to the Dark Ages. Number nine, Plague Bearer. Yep, this one's as awful as it sounds. The title of this one really gives it away. Ah, the hot summer of July 1665. What to do with all of these poor souls who have been hit by the plague in the Dark Ages? Where do we put them, what do we do? You can't just hide them all in the catacombs this time around, so now what? Well, a plague bearer, he's got your back. Church wardens would organize burials, right? This was a normal thing even back in the Dark Ages in the 1600s, but when the plague hit, they had to change things up a little bit. If somebody had the plague, these guys would be responsible for transporting them far, far away and then burying them. A church would house these plague souls away from society. How grim is that? But it's probably a great call, all things considered. Poor guy. Number eight, a knight. When we think of the knights and you know the dark ages and stuff, we often forget about the silly royal duties that one had to attend to. Yeah, you thought jury duty sucked. Oh boy. Beastly justice. You ever heard of this? If not, buckle in. Beastly justice was when animals had to go to court. Yeah, they were put on trial as well, as well as humans. It's wild to look back at a knight and all the things they had to do for their kings and queens, but the fact they also had to wake up early and attend court like a noble, like royal court where a wild animal was now taking the stand. Like what a joke, I'd be like, really? Do I have to be here? I woke up at 4.30, what's going on? Yeah, this would happen after an animal runs through town. It would attack people, you know, being confused and being an animal and all. But the townsfolk would actually believe that the devil was somehow involved in this whole ordeal. Like these animals worked for Big Red himself, right? How weird is that? In 1457, villagers in France had to deal with six pigs who ran wild and attacked locals. They did a lot of damage apparently. But instead of just, you know, setting the animals free or putting them down or whatever, they just took them to court. A real court, like a real trial. There was a judge, a couple prosecutors, eight witnesses, a defense attorney for the pigs, which I gotta say that we gotta do a list on that. That's a t terrible job. That's one of the worst jobs ever, I, I lightly introduced here. These pigs were then hung from a gallows tree. It was so horrible. The dark ages, dark, right? A knight had to formally hang pigs after a trial was concluded. Yeah, being a knight sucked. Number seven, leech collector. I always enjoyed catching frogs growing up. That was always fun, but apparently I, I gotta step my game up. <laughs> this is weak. A leech collector is, well, exactly what you think. Back when medicine was pretty much non-existent, sickness was just wafting throughout these old towns, just eh, moving through towns. Like the G from the Goosebumps logo, just haunting towns, moving through. Scariest intro ever, eh? So the solution back in the day was the classic, oh, if you feel sick, maybe try bleeding for a bit. Mm, see if that helps. Yeah, they would use horses' legs to lure out these leeches, but most of the time, these leech collectors would have to get in and get dirty and just grab them themselves. They would have to swim around and touch as many things as possible. They would make contact with as many leeches as possible. How gross is that? That was the best way to collect them, really. I would have fainted so often, that is horrible. The loss of blood here was obviously so intense, so it was a you know horrible job to have. And on top of that, you gotta look out for the same reason they need leeches in the first place. Disease, yeah, that's still out there. Leech collectors were so common throughout the 18th century that leeches basically were extinct at that point. We almost lost leeches. Oh, so close. Number six, 
jesters. The earliest accounts of the fool go back to the 11th century, so pretty OG. These fools were hired to liven up the party, you know, dance and be silly, wear pajamas. Most of you have an image of a jester in your head, you know, jumping around on tables, telling jokes. That's actually pretty accurate. Yeah, it was pretty fun. It was one of the best jobs to have, obviously. This title of a minstrel, or a fool, rather, it was an honor to have. The fool's payment also was was no funny business, that was good stuff. Roland Le Petier, he was like a major jester back in the day. This guy got 30 acres of land from King Henry II. Just here, here you go, just show up and fart and be funny. Have all this land. That's like a kingdom. You have a kingdom because you're funny and you're silly. He would whistle, jump around, and literally fart on people. On Christmas Day, this guy would come over and just ruin your entire breakfast and just be like, yeah, I have all this land. And then he would take off. Crazy. You just ruined Christmas, sir. Stop farting on my food and family. Thank you. I would never want to be a jester. They had to also like go into battle and like spread bad news too. It was fun and silly, but they were also royal. They had to do lousy stuff too. Number five, groom of the stool. Nowadays, higher ups in the office, they have assistants, you know, to grab your coffee for you. Maybe they answer some phone calls, keep the business running while you're off, you know, doing your businessman stuff. Assistants are vital today. The groom of the stool though, that was, uh, huh, that was a bit much. We have some labor laws put in place now. I don't think we're gonna see any online ads opening for a groom of the stool. We'll see though, fingers crossed, I had good benefits. Back in the dark ages, this role was vital and respected. It was created by King Henry VIII and this role was to assist the king and specifically assist his bowel movements. You had a box that you carried with you at all times. That's where the, that's where the magic happened. The dark magic happened in this box. You would literally follow the king around until he needed to go to the washroom, until he needed Set box. Porta potties weren't a thing back then, and there's no way you're going to catch that king squatting in the woods. In fact, you wouldn't even catch that king wiping his own behind. That chore was also reserved for the groom o the stool. Yeah, lucky you, right? In this stool, you would have water, towels, a wash bowl. The whole setup would be in there. You're probably thinking, Taylor, which poor soul had to be stuck with this role? A prisoner? Somebody who lost their sense of smell, hopefully? No, only sons of noblemen could take on this role. And in doing so, they also gain access to every room in the castle, tons of clothes, any bedchamber furnishings, you name it. And of course, a high pay. Always helps, thank God. That's maybe the worst job in history, maybe. We're almost there, you'll see. Number four, divorce lawyers. If you've seen Game of Thrones, you've heard of trial by combat. That was the that was the norm back in the day. You know, you fight for your freedom. That's great. But what about divorce by combat? What in the Mr. and Mrs. Smith is happening? Was this real? I can't believe this. If you and your significant other weren't getting along in the dark ages, instead of, you know, dishing out thousands on couples therapy and signing all that paperwork and getting it done with and going your separate ways, no, instead they would battle each other. Like combat. It was an organized event too. It had restrictions in place for the husband. It's pretty hilarious to think back on. Like the husband would have to stand in a hole with one hand tied behind his back while the wife ran circles around this hole with a sack full of rocks. A sack full of rocks, how intense is that? That's why you don't cheat in the dark ages, Lancelot, okay? Just take the barn, take the horse, take it all, I quit. Get me out of this hole, untie me. Number three, toshers. Toss a coin to your tosher, here we go. This was one of the worst jobs back in the day and it wasn't even a legal job. Shh, don't tell. If you don't need, uh, if you don't need toshers, Keep, keep their secret, you know? Early 19th century London, I know, a little more modern here, but definitely worth a mention. These toshers would spend all their time in sewers below London trying to find coins or valuables that have been just accidentally washed away. Yeah, they would just search for scrap metals, anything really that nobody else wants to go down and claim, or reclaim rather. It was worth the plunge as well. A lot of these folks would make around 20,000 a year. Just gotta do this a lot, and you're good. Number two, dentist, doctor, surgeon, spy. Dentists were not a thing in the Middle Ages, you know. Dr. Downer didn't politely tell you to floss more and then shake your hands while you're watching a show, getting a cleaning. No, it wasn't like that at all. They did have a barber. They had one guy, he did it all. A barber from the Dark Ages. Yeah, this appointment is gonna suck, my friends. Cavity, toothache, maybe you accidentally bit a rock, chipped a molar. They would only pull these teeth. That was the only solution. Barbers were responsible for cutting hair, pulling teeth, bloodletting, you know, the classic three-in-one appointment we all have to do every month. Doctors were seen throughout history and they've seen a lot of horrible stuff. Back in the 1500s, patients were walking in with an arrow sticking out of their legs. Yeah, instead of cutting the tip off and pulling the opposite way, the arrow removed Mover would come in and then, you know, cut into the injury, opening it more. That's always great. And then you would hold it open and then you'd pull the entire arrow back out of your leg. Yeah, what a fun job. Or chest. Wherever the arrow went, you had to figure that out. This poor soul. And finally, number one, the rat catcher. Another Game of Thrones classic. If you're a rat person, 
I know there's a lot of people who do like rats, like rat tricks, and they have like cool rat friends. That's awesome. I'm not one of those people. I'm not bashing you, but I am bashing this job. This would suck. First of all, rats as a medieval punishment was horrible. Where do I even begin with this one? This was one of the worst punishments for the rats as well. This is a two for one when it comes to pain. A rat trap involved a man being tied down to something and then a metal enclosure would be strapped to his abdomen or chest. And then inside this enclosure, they were rats and they were also like tucked away. And then historically, they would heat the uh, metal enclosure and the rats would panic and try and get out and they would chew through the softest part, which in this case was your chest or abdomen. It was horrible, it was like, an absolute nightmare. But these rats had to come from somewhere, or rather, someone. As the name hints towards, rat catchers are one of the worst jobs you can have in, or rather, out of a castle. It's an important role, you know, just like being a fool or a literal walking, talking toilet. There needs to be a chasseur de rats. Back in those times, rats and mice were the leading source of spreading disease, and with these castles being big and dark, there were probably a lot of them hiding. Black rats were a common household problem, so we need to get those out. So in comes the well-respected rat catcher. These guys would sometimes try new spells to get rid of the rats. Wasn't always helpful, wouldn't work. More often than not, didn't work. So poison powders were the next main trick here. Also the Pied Piper, he was an OG, historically. He would do a musical number to exterminate your pets. If anything, he should be getting a bonus. Any rat catcher, actually, today or back in the dark ages, you deserve a bonus, my friend. You're a brave soul. Number 10, the Doomsday Book, 1085. The Doomsday Book was created under William the First, also known as William the Conqueror. Like, you're already the first, man. You don't need two names, come on. This guy basically drew up a book to document people's money so that he could tax them. Oh yeah, this is the very first time surveyors went town to town and recorded how much money you would owe for simply just doing you. Men would show up at your house asking how much money you made and document your spending habits. Five shillings on groceries, huh? Okay. And five on that phone plan. Look, tax season's coming up, Arthur. It's not looking good, man. Talk about a bunch of crooks, huh? Imagine owing someone money for just trying to make an honest living. Yeah, thank God that didn't catch on, right guys? Oh, speaking of, I got a phone H&R block. Number nine, The Crusades. A three-part miniseries spanning over 200 years. These bloody and ruthless wars were battled between Muslim and Christians for the proprietorship over sacred sites and the land in the East Mediterranean. A three-part miniseries spanning over 200 years. These bloody and ruthless wars were battled between Muslim and Christians for proprietorship over sacred sites and land in the East Mediterranean. Wars that resulted in six million deaths. The Knights Templar, a brotherhood of highly trained soldiers horseback bashing their way through the East. These guys were the real deal, almost like the Navy SEALs of their time. We've seen these paintings, the elite fighting force with the red cross painted on their chests. I wonder if they had to do a hell week. These soldiers were the most trained and savage fighters in all the Christian armies. Richard I leading the third and final crusade, earning him the name Richard the Lionheart. Back then the names were always something so aggressive and scary. It was never like Richard the Clownfish or Henry the Pygmy Goat. No, 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 we need fear way more fear. Number eight, the Magna Carta. The year is 1215. We need some laws, people. This document was one of its kind. A document setting out the laws and limitations from the common man to King John himself. A legal system written down so that there are clear do's and don'ts. No free man shall be seized, imprisoned, dispossessed, outlawed, exiled, or ruined in any way, nor in any way proceeded against except by the lawful judgment of his peers. And the law of the land. Did you get all that? Right that down. Except women. They don't have laws. And they can't act in place. Sometimes people needed to face the music. And even animals. Huh? That's right, animals. Being tried. In a court. A lively and popular event trying any law-breaking animal from goats to pigs to even chickens. Ladies and gentlemen of the court, did you, Mr. Feathers, were peck the floor, yes or no? Objection, your honor, leading the witness. My brain can't fathom this, guys. Number seven, the Battle of Bannockburn. This infamous battle between Scotland and England was one of the most important battles of the Middle Ages. The end of the bloody war for independence. Basically, Scotland was like, yeah, we're gonna go over here and roll our R's. The gruesome wooden wars were caused by the English invading Scotland in 1296. A leader slowly rising the ranks, William Wallace, the guardian of the King of Scotland himself, holds off the English forces and is knighted a hero to Scotland. Unfortunately, like every hero back then, he was also hated. He was captured, hanged, drawn, and quartered. Like, why do you have to do all that after he dies? Like, he's dead. Not fun. The battles between Scotland and England ended in 1314 with Robert the Bruce securing Scotland's independence, adding like 45 more dialects to the UK. Freedom! Number six, the Black Death. Ooh, 
Talk about a curveball. The year's 1348. People are saying things like, don't let the bed bugs bite. Clearly not a very clean and safe time. The Black Death, aka pestilence, aka the great mortality, or simply known as the plague. Single-handedly the worst pandemic ever recorded in history, wiping out somewhere between 70 to 200 million people. Ooh, now I get where bless you comes from. Someone sneezed back then and everyone's dead at 14. This is where we see those doctors in the terrifying bird outfits with the long noses stuffed with garlic and herbs. Um, excuse me? Yeah, he's not wearing a mask. Uh, I'm just trying to watch a cat publicly get skinned. Yeah, six feet please. Some doctors prescribed urinating on a person so that the bad smell would drive out the infection. Can you imagine? Just a doctor writing you up a script and go ahead and pee on yourself about four to five times a day. Take with food should be gone early next week. And just let me put my mask back on here before you leave. There you are. The plague started in Europe in October 1347 when 12 ships from the Black Sea docked at the Sicilian port of Messina. Most sailors aboard the ships were already dead, but those who were still alive were covered head to toe in black boils that oozed pus and blood. Ugh. Sometimes the Black Death included fever, chills, vomiting, diarrhea, temporary loss in motor skills, and then of course, death. Number five, Joan of Arc. Finally, a woman in the Middle Ages. Who'd have thunk? Joan of Arc was considered and still is revered the heroine of France for her role in the Siege of Orleans during France's Hundred Year War with England. Joan of Arc, a peasant with faith on her side, had believed that God had chosen her to lead France in victory against England and had spoken to her since she was young. At only age 17, she had stolen men's armors, a white horse, and like a Valkyrie riding into battle, she had convinced an entire army that she was appointed by God to win. And then did! That's the most badass thing I've ever heard in my entire life. After such a miraculous victory, her reputation spread among France, and upon her capture and death at 19, the Maid of Orleans herself would forever live on as one of the greatest saints and symbols of the country of France. Number four, Henry V. Another war? All these people do is kill each other. Does anyone fish? Or golf? No one, huh? Just swords and heads, swords and heads. A history itself. This time, England beats France. King Henry V, Prince Hal himself, leans into his kingly duties, demolishing France and what Shakespeare would delve into years to come. The Battle of Agincourt is one of England's most celebrated victories and was one of the most important triumphs in the Hundred Years' War. Then, should the warlike Harry, like himself, assume the port of Mars, and at his heels, leashed in like hounds, should famine, sword, and fire crouch for employment, Henry V, prologue. Good stuff. How come these guys didn't just like rap battle or play soccer or something? Like an arrow right through the chest is way worse than a red card, just saying. Hey, speaking of soccer. Number three, mob football. I'm not talking about the mafia. Put a thousand on Brady, would you? I'm talking about mob football, also known as folk football. It's just like our modern day soccer, town versus town. Except it has an unlimited amount of players. And there's only two rules to the game. Get the inflated pig's bladder over the opposing team's lines on the other side of town and no murdering. I mean, I guess this is closer to rugby? Yeah, this, this is literally just rugby. This game was played competitively and eventually outlawed at Oxford University in 1555. Just a guy named Jeeves in a polo. Oh yeah, I play uh, mob football at Oxford. <sighs> yeah, I'm, uh, I'm also in a frat. This game got so out of hand, it was banned numerous times in England. There is great noise in the city caused by hustling over large balls from which many evils may arise, which God forbid. We command and forbid on behalf of the king, on pain of imprisonment, such game to be used in the city of the future. Thankfully, this game has calmed down over the years and now has become the most popular played and watched game across the world. Go Liverpool! Number two, the printing press. The printing press is a machine that was designed for the mass printing of text mostly in form of books and newspapers. With an unknown date of origin, first invented in China, this machine designed in the 15th century by Johannes Gutenberg was a revolutionary new form of writing which would only change the direction of history with the mass production of uniform text. Eh, long story short, people didn't have to get the world's worst wrist cramp writing Hamlet over and over again. To be, or not to be, 86 more folios? The alphabetical metal keys would be placed into the device and slammed into the paper, pressing ink upon the parchment. You know there's gotta be some books half written in purple ink because they just ran out of black. Come on, we've all been there. Ink's expensive. Number one, William Shakespeare. The bard himself, arguably the most influential writer of the English language. William Shakespeare was born in Stratford, England, 
One of the easiest ways we can look back into the dialogue and lifestyle used by the people living in the Middle Ages. This playwright documents the world in which he lives from 1564 to 1616. Due to Shakespeare's unbelievable talent for building and fabricating an array of diverse stories and characters via players, Modern day is able to see the Middle Ages and the similarities and differences the people were experiencing. His plays are based in the environment that they were written in. He writes about diseases, he writes about monarchy, he writes about women's rights. Okay, so no one actually got turned into a donkey by some fairies in the woods, but some of those wars actually did happen. And some of those kings and queens were really twisted. How this man created so many brilliant works and stories all part of the mystery. Number 10, Treaty of Verdun. The Treaty of Verdun, or also known as de Verdun was a contract agreed on in August 843 in which divided the Frankish Empire into three kingdoms among the surviving sons of the Emperor Louis I. The firstborn son and heir of Charlemagne. Long story short, all the grandsons were all at civil war with each other about who was getting what, what did Grant promise. The treaty followed shortly after almost three years of wars between the brothers. It was the first in a series of partitions contributing to the dissolution of Charlemagne's empire and it is seen as a blueprint in which modern societies are are based off of. Basically, the brothers all had to split what their grandfather had decreed his own into land. Lothair, the first, coolest name, Charlemagne's eldest son, received Francia Media, or the Middle Frankish Kingdom. Louis II received Francia Orientalis, or the East Frank Kingdom. And Charles II received Francia Occidentalis, or the West Frankish Kingdom. You and I both know the youngest got the most. Come on, I'm just gonna say it right out. Everyone likes to talk about the eldest son this and the eldest son that, but we all know the baby gets whatever they want whenever they want, don't they, huh? I'm looking at you, Taylor. Come here, man. It's true, man. The baby gets everything. Middle child? This guy didn't even exist growing up. Didn't hear from him. Number nine, Underground Castle. Big Chet and I are currently replaying Ocarina of Time, so in honor of Hyrule, I gotta include this medieval castle. It was once a residence during the reign of King Henry III. This castle was actually discovered recently underneath a prison yard back in 2015. The old prison castle, we love those. Shawshank Redemption 2, medieval edition. Super recent discovery. Archaeologists discovered walls of a castle underneath the basketball court in southwest England at a former prison. Yeah, dudes were shooting threes over top of kingdom and they had no idea. How amazing is that? This was the same castle that played part in the mid 1100s during England's civil war. The castle actually fell later in the 1400s and the prison was built on the grounds later in the 1700s until it closed its gates forever in 2013. And then we were shooting threes and then we discovered it, of course. If I was a ghost haunting these grounds, I would make every shot miss easily I would just float near the net tap the ball away like nice try mm. back to prison mm. number eight stone masonry so we all know about who wrote what and who translated what to what text and which language while writing what play, which was based on who, but who built all this stuff? When we think of the Dark Ages, we can't forget the megalithic Leviathan stones carved and molded together to create the enormous Gothic castles and cathedrals that are still standing to this day. How did people do it back then? Well, masons in medieval England were responsible for building. Masons were highly skilled craftsmen, and their trade was primarily used in the building of castles, churches, and cathedrals. There were three main classes of stone masons. There was the apprentice, the journeyman, and the master mason. So what would a medieval construction site exactly look like? Well, of course, there's the master mason. He's usually the head and the overseer of the work, and he's the most skilled of the tradesmen. This is like the head honcho on site. We've all seen this guy walking around site. He's always angry, he's always yelling, hey, who's got the plans? You, give me those, what are these? Eh, yeah, backwards, you idiot. I would have put the window down there. Yeah. So how did they exactly chisel out all of these castles from one giant rock? Well, they didn't. The stone had to be quarried first from quarrymen. These were not masons. Their job was to get the stone for the masons to work on out of the ground. Local stone was used first, but occasionally stone could travel vast distances, even from other countries. And so I gotta drag that boulder there all the way to Scotland? Okay. Some of the most beautiful architecture ever created can be still seen across Europe. The amount of time and skill it took for these people to have designed, constructed, and chiseled such megalithic sites still baffles me. I'd be trying to read the plan still. Oh, I s that's north. I got the... I got it, we're good. Number seven, apple bobbing. In a time where bodies were literally piling up on the side of the road, I can't believe 
we got apple bobbing out of the whole ordeal. That's crazy. It seems like ill timing, but it is the dark ages. What can you do? Apples historically have always been a symbol of importance. The Greek golden apple started the Trojan War. Snow White's poison apple was a symbol of importance in literature and all that good stuff and growing up. And in the Middle Ages, apples were viewed as a symbol of romance and fertility. These things have roots, pun intended, of course. In medieval times, bobbing for apples was flirty. It was their version of speed dating, dare I say. What happened was all the leftover apples from the big harvest were then put into a big bucket. Each apple had a villager's name on it, and then maidens would have three chances. Three chances to grab that apple with their teeth. Three chances to win a date with the English Tad Hamilton. What a weird time. Can you imagine if this was in Game of Thrones? Reek is just shivering for two seasons, bobbing for Ramsay's Bolton apples. We're like, medieval times were dark, holy sh**. Number six. The feudal system, aka feudalism, was a form of structure system existing in medieval Europe in which people would work and fight for nobles who gave them protection and land in return. A social political system in which landowners would contractually bind tenants to exchange their goods, loyalty, and simple space for safety and comfort within the laws of those ruling. Basically, this is like our renter's agreement now. I'll give you a place to stay and some heat. You give me an unfathomable and overpriced amount of shillings for these extremely low ceilings. Yeah, talk about crooks, man. This system stayed in place for more than a thousand years and managed to fizzle its way out of society somewhere in the 15th century. Not just anybody would ask to be signed to this deal. There was structure and there was order. There was a lord, AKA the landowner, AKA your landlord, allowing vassals, AKA tenants, to rent the land by providing services especially military services. Yeah, you can stay here, but once in a while, we're gonna need you to dump a bunch of boiling water and over that wall. Is that cool? Yeah, you're fine with that. The plot of land, called a fief, was typically worked on by serfs, who were laborers, who had very few rights and were bound to the land itself. These were the lowest class of people, and they basically did any and all to stay safe on the Lord's land. Jobs would include farming, jobs would include cleaning, and was a minimum of three days work to maintain a good standing and remain stationary. Ah, sure, there was no dental or mental health days, but come on. A three-day work week? Plant a couple of carrots here and there? Hey, it doesn't seem that bad. Number five, fear the dead. With The Walking Dead on their 47th season, I think it's time to take a peek into zombie history, shall we? And find out where this grim idea really started. Well, it's certainly not a new one, I'll tell you that for free. As far back as the early 1300s, residents were buried in the village of Warren Percy, where archeologists discovered them many moons later, and they discovered marks on their bones. Cuts, burn marks, you name it. Apparently, this was all done after they had passed away. But why? Scientists believe that these injuries inflicted after their untimely death were to prevent them from being reanimated. You know, coming back to life and haunting your village. To keep them in their graves, of course. Unless this dude did something to piss off an entire village that much, they were clearly afraid of this corpse coming back to haunt them. Number four. Studia Generali. This period also saw the birth of what we call the modern university. This was a culmination of material translated and taught to provide a new infrastructure to scientific scholars. Some of these new universities were registered by the Holy Roman Empire as an institution of international excellence, giving it the title Studium Generali, or better known as Studia Generale. Most of the early Studia Generale were discovered in Italy, Spain, England, and France. These places of study were considered the most prestigious places of learning in all of Europe. I bet you the school hoodies were still so expensive. Just someone's old textbook with a mustache drawn on Marcus Aurelius. The list and number of institutions began to grow as new universities were founded throughout Europe. As early as the 13th century, scholars from the Studia Generale were encouraged to speak and lecture courses at other institutions within Europe to share documents and information which led to the current academic culture seen in modern universities today. It's a TED talk, come on. There had to be one cool professor back then, like the guy who lets the class teach itself, orders pizza, has tenure, and hates the monarchy. Number three, medieval taverns. Say you want to grab a pint with the local lads. Where do you get an IPA in the dark ages? Where do we get a six pack of Arthurian ale? Well, this is the medieval ages, so instead of venturing through the woods to hopefully maybe find another town, just ask thy neighbor. That's right, in the Middle Ages, you could brew your own ale. No problem, no one's asking any questions. Give it a shot. In the late 12th century, baking bread was not freely permitted, but making ale in your basement was. Uh, I guess that's great. So the higher ups, the noble lords, they wouldn't care if you made ale and had a block party, but if you made a weak ale or it was improperly measured and then distributed, then and only then do you get a fine. Arrest this man at once. Number two, St. Patrick. St. Patrick was a fifth century Roman British Christian missionary and bishop in Ireland. Also known as the apostle of Ireland, although he is the first apostle, 
having lived prior to the current laws of the Catholic Church. He is considered a saint in the Catholic Church and is regarded as the Enlightener of Ireland. The dates of Patrick's life are not certain, but there is a consensus that he was active in Ireland during the 5th century, making his rounds as a missionary, speaking the good word of God. But let's get into what everyone talks about with this guy. The good stuff, like slamming a green Guinness or getting all the snakes out of Ireland. I mean, I love the structure and the faith and stuff, but also chasing every snake out of an entire country with a walking stick? Shoo! Shoo, you fool, you bleeding bleeder! Go! Go! Do you know how big Ireland is? St. Patrick's Day is on March 17th, the supposed date of his death in 461 AD. It is enjoyed inside and outside Ireland as a religious and cultural holiday and remains a celebration of Ireland itself. And finally, number one, dancing plague. A medieval plague, but make it groovy. Yeah, let's start dancing. That's right, the dancing plague. This was a real danger back in 1518. I'll try not to laugh, but it's, I can't, I'll try. This was perhaps one of the weirdest events in history. Fra Trofea was the first victim of said plague. She was moving her body around frantically, so much so that it resembled a dance or something, in the middle of the Holy Roman Empire. And as if that wasn't weird already, dozens of others began to join. And then more, and then more, all moving their bodies with a similar wacky frantic twist. This was long before Chubby Checker came along, so we still have no idea what was going on here. Like, we're out of guesses at this point. This twist lasted for months. People were dropping on the spot. It was scary and confusing. In total, there were around 400 victims that fell to this mysterious illness. That's a lot of deaths, that's a lot of real deaths. This was documented in 16th century historical records, so I don't think the story is made up per se. No one would make this up, it's terrifying. A Catholic saint at the time, Saint Vitus, was believed to have the power to curse people with said dancing plague. What an amazing power also. Guy starts moonwalking away, you're like, beat it. Some suggest this was a cult, others believe they ate toxic rye. Who's to say for sure, either way. We're all dancing. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have heresy. Okay, I can admit when I'm wrong, and in the last video last week, I messed up. I said the wrong word when talking about spoiled queens. You guys pointed it out. Yeah, I read your comments. Okay, and now we're here to redeem ourselves. I'm learning, you're already smart, let's get into it. In medieval times, it could be dangerous to disagree. Nowadays, many people like to keep an open mind. There's so many cultures, beliefs, people think different things, and that is totally okay. But it absolutely was not okay in the Dark Ages. Oh no. In these times, if you held any kind of belief that could go against the teaching of the Christian church, you were seen as a heretic. Many leaders, whether kings or crusaders, or even missionaries and merchants, especially from the late 11th century, fought to have Christianity take over in the Mediterranean world. People belonging to other faiths, such as Jewish and Muslim people, suffered persecution and expulsion. In England, there were massacres, and in the late 12th century, Edward I banned all Jewish people from England. I mean, this quite literally set the stage for the Spanish Inquisition in 1478, which was aimed at establishing Spain as a united, single Christian faith. Wars in medieval Europe weren't just waged on people of different faiths, however, it was also aimed at some Christians who people believed to be heretics. This is all to say that heresy was a serious crime in these times, and thinking outside of what you were told to think at the time and what was accepted could have landed you a death sentence. Number 9. Facial Expressions I can't grow facial hair. I'm not sure if you noticed that watching, but it's never happened. It's not gonna happen, quite frankly. I don't have to worry about trimming a beard early in the morning, anything like that, which is fine, to be honest with you. I can't, I'm not really complaining. Back in the medieval ages, I would have been set. People would have been pretty, I don't know, would have been more than ideal. The no hair look was the way to do it. The forehead was seen as the central point of your face, so it was common back in the medieval times for individuals to pluck all of their eyelashes and remove their eyebrows completely. So people would just be looking at you like, nothing going on, no facial expressions, just bald everything. Many would go as far as to pluck their hairline back even further so they have the round, oval, queen bald look. Imagine that. Imagine everyone's bald in Game of Thrones. Think it'd still get the rankings that it does? Probably not. Probably not. Macy Williams is just... In our number eight spot today, we have Animal Court. 
The history of animals being put on trial goes back pretty far as it is believed it has roots in ancient Athens, but it was definitely a common practice as recently as the 18th century. Courts would go after things like rats, weevils, flies, locusts, and serpents for damaging crops, and when punished, they weren't just liable for damages, they could be banished and excommunicated. Like imagine trying to banish a fly. This isn't where it ends though. In civil criminal court, they'd have livestock being tried for violent against humans. Like, I'm sorry, your honor, my client could not tell the prosecution that she didn't want to be milked because she's a cow. Kicking was the only way. As an example of a real animal court case, let's take it back to 1457 France. Villagers in a town witnessed a sow and her six piglets attack and kill someone. Terrible story, sounds absolutely horrifying to have to witness. In this day and age, animal control would be called and all of those pigs would likely put down. But not in these times. When this happened, all the pigs were sent to court. Like real court. There was a judge, two prosecutors, eight witnesses, and a defense attorney for the accused animals. Witnesses provided testimony that proved that the sow had most definitely attacked the person and was definitely responsible for the crime. The piglets, however, well, for them, testimony was a bit murkier. There wasn't a witness who actually saw any of the piglets do any actual attacking. They just had blood on them, which isn't necessarily a sign of their guilt. It just means that they were there. This is why the court, while they did sentence the sow to death, the piglets were exonerated for their role in the crime. It's very strange and now would be a very expensive system, but in those times, it really did work for them. Number seven, inns and taverns. When we think of a medieval tavern or an inn, it's important to note the difference. Yes, there's drinking in both, and yes, both of them don't smell so great. But inns, their sole purpose was to house travelers comfortably, whereas a tavern, not so much housing. More rough housing, if anything, if you catch my drift. Say you're passing by one of these taverns, right, Saturday night, you feel like grabbing some questionable ale from some questionable establishment? Well, you better come prepared. In the Middle Ages, you had to bring your own fork everywhere you went. Just a single, just one fork on your side, on your person, that's so gross. We didn't have a guy sitting in booth 11 doing roll ups all night, looking at you, just wishing that he didn't work there, right? This was the middle ages, you didn't have a fork. No one had forks. If you had a fork, you were lucky, right? You were the rich kid on the block with an in-ground pool. That was you if you had a fork. Steak knives also were only reserved for carvers, so. Until the 17th century, you were just poking around your meal until you had a bite-sized amount, and then you ugh, would choke on it because it's all horrible. It's all chewy and horrible. In our number six spot today, we have the filth. If you lived in a city during this time in history, it would have been an absolutely filthy place to be. I mean, human and rats lived in harmony. Not harmony, re the plague. But things were so dirty, rats were everywhere. Want to go swimming in the nice stream nearby? Huh, well, good luck, because not only is that body of water used for dumping sewage, but it's also for the village's water supply to both drink and bathe in. Disease was plentiful, obviously, and it spread exceptionally quickly. Spreading disease was even easier considering how all of the homes were packed full of people and no one really knew anything about hygiene and the benefits yet health and otherwise. If you were to go out in the evening, especially at past curfew, it was also an insanely huge risk. Going out ran you the risk of getting killed or robbed with no police on the streets to help protect you at all. While city living provided a bit of safety in numbers situation compared to the countryside and also provided more opportunities to make money, it was still quite a risky place to live during the dark ages. Number five, teeth worms. Awesome, you have any cavities? Now you're gonna be looking this whole video. Dentists weren't common back in the dark ages, but they did have a barber. So I guess we're good for a few hundred years. This guy did it all. Cavities, toothaches, teeth, worms, gross, you name it, he'll pull it out violently. Barbers were responsible for cutting hair, pulling teeth, bloodletting, your classic three-in-one appointment right there, really all in 10 minutes or less. Instead of brushing with tooth tunes, back then you would rub your teeth and gums with a rough linen. Yeah, just grab an old shirt, it's an old dirty shirt, we're gonna brush up for school. Like you're playing a harmonica, only dirty shirt. A few recipes have been discovered since for pastes and powders to freshen their breath back then, you know. Otherwise, you were pretty screwed, you had nothing. We went from powdered charcoal to charcoal toothpaste all over again. What a weird loop we did. Mouthwashes were also made from herbs and spices steeped in wine or vinegar, so fresh breath guaranteed, no doubt about it. In our number four spot today, we have the stripes ban. 
We've all met someone before who seems to be concerned with what other people are wearing, and we jokingly refer to them as the fashion police. But back in the dark ages, you might come across some very real fashion police who are actually interested in finding you, should your finest tunic not be of the local dress code. Sometimes it wasn't even just a fine, some serious fashion faux pas could lead to your imprisonment or even your death. Stripes were definitely a main culprit in these times, as striped clothing was seen as a garment of the devil. I'm not even exaggerating either. In the year 1310 in a French town, there was a local cobbler who was put to death because he had been caught in striped clothes. Yeah, we thought the tabloids were harsh, and I mean, they are, but the medieval fashion police were unforgiving. Not only were members of clergy not exempt from this rule, but neither were animals. Yeah, calling all zebras. Good luck out there, man. This is why zebras were called beasts of the devil. And yes, this is even though the people of Europe hadn't even seen them. Just heard tales of their striped nature. Number three, no rules football. In honor of the World Cup coming to a close, we have to take a look at football back in the late 12th century. Yeah, what did that look like? Or feel like, rather? Instead of corner kicks and throw ins, you could do anything you wanted to retrieve the ball from the opposing team. Yeah, anything. Left hooks, some kicks, some jabs, throwing rocks, anything, you name it, it was violent. No diving in these games, I'll tell you that for free, you didn't have to. There was also no time limit. <clears throat> there was also no limit to how many players could be involved. So choose your team wisely, pick the biggest guy, pretty much. It's town versus town a lot of the time. There's a lot of emotions out there settled on the field. And in the middle of it somewhere, there would be a soccer ball rolling around. I would call this a sport. Now finally, come 1314, King Edward II banned the game. And yeah, more than fair. Pause civilians and citizens are dying. He's like, yeah, maybe not. Maybe it's not wise. I don't know. In our number two spot today, we have fast medieval marriage. There are so many messed up medieval marriage practices. We could do an entire video on just that. And in fact, we have. Go check those out. But while you're here, let's talk just a bit about them. Marriage in the medieval times was quick and easy, but also difficult to prove. If you and your loved one wanted to get married, all you really needed to do was say, we're married, and then boom, it's done. Of course, this led to a whole pile of those spur of the moment type marriages, especially considering how sex before marriage was widely condemned in these times. You know, people are like, eh, it. We're married now, let's do it. Well, I'm pretty sure many people who were divorced would have preferred if their marriages were this easy. This led to people, of course, taking advantage of this difficult to prove thing. Most especially women would often fall victim to a man who might want to take you as his wife for the night. But then the following day, after getting what he wants, he denied ever agreeing to the union of the two. If you're catching my drift. This is why many women tried to get at least one witness to union, just in case. And finally, number one. Pointed shoes. This one's so fun. Whenever I see anything that's related to the medieval times, I always admire the attire, right? Especially the shoes. I hate buying shoes today so much. Now they're so specific. You got walking, running, trail shoes. They're always so expensive. Nobody does it like the medieval times anymore. Specifically, Krakows. Krakows were awesome. They were the style of shoe commonly worn in the 15th century Europe that looked really ridiculous. They had the long huge long nose that went up really high. They're so silly looking, maybe that's why I love them. These long-toed shoes first appeared in the 12th century, but the Krakow, the thing is, these things were twice as long as your foot, and that was considered fancy back then. These meant business, so you better watch those ankles, Beth, all right? We're going into some meetings. Fast. They were named after the city that they were made in. Krakows were worn by everybody at one point, but as cheeky as it sounds, the longer the shoe, the more valuable you were. There we go. So it turned into a joke eventually, right? These things got way too long and it looked ridiculous. You ever walk around in flippers beside the pool where you do that big silly walk? That's the walk that everybody was doing in town, right? It was out of hand. They would be stuffed with horse hair or moss. Yeah, which is just as comfortable as Dr. Scholl's. Imagine stepping around in moss all day, yuck. Also, sometimes a string would be needed to be tied from the tip of the shoe to your knee just to keep these damn things afloat. So everybody at one point in time, in the medieval times, looked like a Muppet tied to strings. How amazing is that? Do you own any Krakows? If so, how do we get our hands on a pair? I'm a size 11 and a half Krakow. 
Let's make it happen. Maybe if we all pitch in as a community. I don't know, we can all be wearing Krakows tomorrow. Kicking off our list at number 10, the London Tornado. We've all heard about the Great Fire of London in 1666. So let's talk about another horrible event from history, shall we? That's why I'm here after all. On October 16th, 1091, harsh winds from the Southwest took out more than 600 houses and a handful of churches. There was a mighty tornado. The Church of St. Mary was a rather unholy place to be on that specific day. The tornado two men in this building and it tore up the roof and timbers went everywhere. The rafters were actually ripped from the structure then slammed down far away back into the earth. Turns out historically about half of these rafters were buried in the dirt. That's how much force was thrashing them about. Tornadoes are so scary. I feel a strong wind outside and I'm immediately back inside, that's it. I'm shaking in my boots. I don't mess with wind. Number nine, the great drowning of men. Such a tragic name, my lord. How about we take out the word great and all these references maybe, I don't know, it's kind of horrible. In the Middle Ages, coastal areas around the North Sea were hot spots for flooding. Now historically, there were numerous reports of flooding here and for some reason, between the 11th and 15th centuries, this area would get absolutely destroyed. It would get completely swamped. And it's even larger than you can possibly imagine. The St. Marcellus flood took place on January 16th, 1362. Now the death toll here, I mean, obviously it's impossible to tell for sure, but historians believe it was at least 25,000 people. That's horrible. Atlantic gales were to blame for the rush of water because this event also goes hand in hand with the great wind of 1362. The great wind, awesome. The mighty wind, like it's not great at all. It's not really good. Number eight, one name. This next one here blows my mind. I never really thought about this before, but what was it like before we had surnames. Surnames were introduced to us in England in 1066, but before then, well, you were just Greg, period. That's it. There was another Greg, well, that was it. Now you guys had to fight till the death. No, I'm just kidding. At first, surnames were a little bit different. They were descriptions, almost, about the person you were meeting. So you'd meet a guy and he would say, hey, I'm Greg Red. Red signified his red hair. Makes sense, Greg Red, Greg Gray, he's getting a little old, got it, Gregs, we're good. But the best part, your name could actually change over time, because your description and then your appearance would also change. So one day you would meet Greg Red, but eventually his hair would fall out, he would age, then get stressed because, you know, he's living in the medieval times and all. And then once that happens, your name would change to match your new description. Now you're Greg Ball. Ball back then meant bald in Middle English, so everyone had the last name Ball. Isn't that amazing? Next video, I'll be Taylor Ball. I'll just be bald. Why not? Just change it up like Heisenberg. Number seven, medieval meals. Ah, yes. I hope you're eating while you're watching this. If so, give it a thumbs up, take a big bite, and good luck. Seeing as the holidays just passed, I figured there's no better time to mention a medieval holiday tradition. I'm glad we don't do this one anymore. This one's pretty gross. Swans today, they're beautiful. We see them traveling in pairs, and we don't hunt them down because, well, that would be insane, right? Medieval days, swans were hot property. They were a delicacy of the upper classes. Christmas swan pie. Nice. Here you go. For you and yours. Enjoy. Merry Christmas. I would be crying on Christmas Day if I saw this on the table. They would actually stuff swans with beef, which I personally don't recommend. Turkeys, I'm like, okay, that we've dealt with. Swans, I'm like, no. But they're in love. They mate for life. Do we eat both? Let's eat both, I guess. Other medieval meals included peacocks, cranes, turtle doves, sparrows, and herons. Herons? Imagine Christmas dinner is a heron lying on the table. You're like, Really, Dad? I don't really want to eat this. This is a long, the long neck. Number six, the dancing plague. Okay, summer 1518, a summer we will never forget, sadly. One of the most bizarre events in medieval history, the dancing plague. The town of Strasbourg was calm, cool, and or collect until out of nowhere, one woman began to dance dance uncontrollably in the streets. She was convulsing, it was wild, but then soon others joined in and eventually there were over 400 people dancing their days away. Now it sounds funny in some degree, but it's really tragic. This was not a good time at all. A great amount lost their lives due to pure exhaustion and heart attacks and the authorities tried their best to help the situation so they paid for musicians to perform for them while they danced, while they were convulsing. They're like, oh yes, bring in a jazz band. Let's complete this image. This happened a few times in Europe, not just once. Between the 14th and the 17th centuries, we still don't know what exactly happened, but there were 
dance plague, so it was a common occurrence. All we know is that it was some sort of illness. It was not like step up. It wasn't a fun thing like step up at all. No one's just popping and locking in the streets. They're like, hey, nice, let's bring in some music. This is great. No, people were very sick, they were very ill. Number five, Shroud of Turin. They say art is subjective, but what does the Shroud of Turin really show us here? Is it JC? Is it Jesus Christ himself? Many believe the cloth shows an image of Jesus when he was crucified, and once you see it, it's hard to argue otherwise, hard to get out of your mind. Radiocarbon tests do date the cloth back to around 1260, and recent studies suggest that shroud was used in medieval church plays that would depict this exact scene, the resurrection of one Jesus Christ. What do you think? Accurate representation or another case of face pareidolia? Face pareidolia is when you see Jesus and things. I look at our producer Chris, I see Jesus every day right there. A little bit more Jack than Jesus, but you know, same image, more or less. Number four, summer is canceled. Back in 2013, scientists discovered a volcano on Lombok Island in Indonesia that went off sometime around May to October 1257. And scientists all agree that this eruption was the largest blast that the Earth had seen in 7,000 years. So it was quite a spectacle, a horrible spectacle. If that cut to the next year, 1258, the following cold temperatures ruined crops and brought famine to pretty much all of Europe. Cattle were all dying off quickly. It was far too cold for them to even stand a chance. And it's estimated that London saw 15,000 deaths that year alone. Experts believe that this volcanic eruption was a factor in the Little Ice Age that changed global temperatures from the 14th to 19th century. That's like if Yellowstone went off tomorrow. It would be a really bad time, and then well, afterwards would be almost worse, if anything. No resorts for a while, I think. Definitely not. Number three, the Great Famine. The medieval adjective game, back again with the Great Famine. Awesome, another great. All of Northern Europe suffered the Great Famine in 1315, so only like 60 years after that volcano went off. I mean like, what luck is that? What a terrible time to be alive. 1315 to 1317, two years of famine, countless lives were lost, and of course, with people losing hope, crime rate shot up to an extreme level. Can't even describe some of the things that were recorded, but my God, people were, Horribly insane. The Great Famine brought unrest in peasants, but it also disturbed members of nobility. It's always nice when that happens, right? It's not all of us suffering. Some of these noble purple lords up here are also starving. Cool, we're even. They were set back and in turn, they gave up the oath of chivalry. Now talk about the dark ages. They're like, eh, you know what? No. Number two, plague bear. Bus boys, but for bodies. Let's do it. My God, this one's really dark. The hot summer of July 1665, right before London saw that great fire. What to do with all of these poor souls who have been hit by the plague? Now bodies at this point were literally starting to pile up. So we need a new profession, somebody that deals specifically with these horribly infected bodies. Any volunteers, show of hands? Yep, we got one. Like a plague bear, for example. There we go, just what we need. A plague bear has your back and your front and all of your infected places. Church wardens would organize burials. This was a normal thing back in the 1600s, but when the plague hit, they had to change things up. If somebody had the plague, well, these plague bearers, they, these brave souls, they would step up. They were the ones responsible for transporting all these bodies far, far, away, and then they would bury them, right? Just way over there. Great idea, honestly, the further the better. Couldn't agree more. A church would house these plagued souls away from society. Now, it sounds sad, but this was the best call, all things considered. So no, you weren't visiting any of your deceased loved ones anytime soon. And finally, number one, medieval punishment cleaner. This one really sucks. Best for last, here we go. Back in medieval times, many executions were public. The town would come out, watch a hanging or two, and then grab some bread and then head home. They're like, hey, classic Sunday. This was normal back in medieval days. Medieval punishments were like an event, but like modern events, somebody has to stick around and clean the place up. One of the earliest documented executioners goes back to 1202. He was the OG headsman. His name was Nicholas Johan, and their nickname was The Justice. The Justice. Are you kidding me? My palms are already sweating. Are you sure it wasn't the mountain? My God. Afterwards, this position spread through many capitals and large towns of Western Europe, and with them came the execution cleaners. Yeah, just a squeegee and a spray bottle. They're like, hey, which table boss? Let's do this. Over his 36 years of ruling, King Henry VIII executed roughly 57,000 people. Yeah, welcome to the Middle Ages. Hope you like mopping. 
You're gonna be doing it a lot, like a lot, a lot. Number 10, where's my mummy? Interior of a kitchen, oil on canvas, by Martin Drolling, was painted in 1815 and depicts shades of browns, tans, beiges, and golds that were remarkable of the era. Where did he get these colors, some had wondered. Well, good old Martin had a little help from the dead. Mummy Brown was appropriately named as it was made up of, you guessed it, ground up mummies. From the 16th to the 19th century, many painters favored the pigment and it remained available well into the 20th century, even as supplies dwindled. Egyptian mummies are rare nowadays, not because a few survived thousands of years in their tombs, but because few survived the aesthetic and cannibal demands of Europeans. Eating Egyptian mummies reached its peak in Europe by the 16th century. Mummies could be found on apothecary shelves, either in broken shards or ground into powder. So why did these nutcase Europeans believe that there was medicinal value in a mummy? Bitumen. Abundant in the Middle East, where formed in geological basins of the remains of tiny plants and animals, it could be semi-liquid or semi-solid. It is viscous when heated and hardened when dried, making it useful for broken bones and rashes. Supposedly, bitumen with wine cured chronic coughs and combined with vinegar, it'll dissolve clotted blood. Other uses included the treatment of cataracts, toothaches, and skin disease. Because of the stickiness, it was called mum or mummia. You see where the mix up is coming in? So when the invasive colonial Europeans saw the black stuff coating these ancient remains for the first time, they assumed it to be that valuable bitumen or mummia they'd heard about. They were quick to start gobbling it down. The mummified remains of Egyptian pharaohs were sold as medicine in Germany well into the 20th century. And Speaking of the dead, how about using them for decor? Ballroom of bones is number nine. Not all bones are tasty enough to eat, and sometimes you got more of them than you can handle. So that's where ossuaries come in. In older times when people perished often before 50, there was obviously a lot more human remains to be disposed of. But sometimes there's not more space. So as a space saving technique, the skeletal remains of buried bodies would be dug up and moved into underground crypts called ossuaries. Many more remains could be stored that way as bones didn't need the whole space that a body did and could also be stacked, hung, or broken into position. The Brno ossuary in the Czech Republic is the second biggest in Europe, featuring chandeliers, artwork, words, crosses, really anything that can be made up of bones. These structures and pieces can be incredibly elaborate. Hall State Charnel House features hundreds of hand-painted skulls, and the Sadlik Church ossuary even features a large crown made up of human remains hanging over the pew where they preach from. If you're goth, you may want to consider that for a marriage location. Let's get hot with Greek fire in at number 8. Greek fire, arguably the Jesus of the flame world for its ability to walk on water, baffles historians and scientists alike to this day. Invented in the Byzantine Empire in the 7th century, this fire was used to defend their empire from invaders. Countless documentation verifies to us today that the stories of this fire was very real, but because its formula was state secret, nobody's quite sure what it was used to create this liquid. The substance could be thrown in pots or shot from tubes. It apparently caught fire spontaneously and could not be extinguished with water. It could burn on top of it. It was heated and pressurized, then delivered via a tube called a siphon at the Grecian enemies. What's truly fascinating about Greek fire is that armies who captured the liquid concoction were unable to recreate it for themselves. They also failed to recreate the machine that it was delivered from. To this day, nobody knows exactly what the ingredients went into this mixture. Dance the day, night, and your life away with number seven in the countdown. The Kavik incident is one of the first few recorded instances of dancing plagues. Later, there are stories of unstoppable, sometimes fatal, dancing in the German town Efrat in 1247. Shortly after, 200 people are said to have danced themselves all over a bridge of the Moselle River in Maastricht until it collapsed, drowning them all. The 1518 event was most thoroughly documented and probably the last of several such outbreaks in Europe, which took place largely between the 10th and the 16th centuries. A woman reportedly stepped into the street and began dancing, seemingly unable to stop, and she kept dancing until she collapsed from exhaustion. After resting, she resumed the compulsive frenzied activity. The more she continued, the more others were afflicted, and within a week, 30 others mimicked her strange behavior. Alarmed city officials thought maybe more or better dancing was the solution, so they gathered up the real pros and some music and arranged dancing halls to help the afflicted boogie this out. Instead, the opposite happened, and now as many as 400 people were consumed by the dancing compulsion. A number of them died from their exertions. In early September, the mania began to abate, and that's the 
last we know of this phenomena. So what is this plague, and why were all these people dancing themselves to doom? Well, the explanation at the time was the usual stuff like demonic possession or your blood was too hot. Modern day, it's likely because of ergot poisoning from molding rye flour used to make their bread, as it's been known to cause hysteria and convulsions. To this day, hundreds of accounts of dancing plagues are found recorded in dark ages, but we have no explanation as to why. I don't see dead people, I see green people. The Woolpit alien children are number six in our countdown. Two English chroniclers reported a story from the 12th century that villagers of Woolpit discovered two children, a brother and sister, who had green skin and spoke an unknown language. The children were quickly taken to hire officials, Richard D. Colney's house, where he attempted to communicate and failed. The children also refused to eat for days on end until seeing green beans in the garden, which they ate straight out of the ground. They stayed with Richard long term as he converted them to a normal diet and they started to lose the green pigmentation. Obviously after time and growth these children learned English and when they were asked where they were from they told Richard, we are inhabitants of the land of St. Martin, who is regarded with peculiar veneration in the country which gave us birth. They further explained that where they were from everything was green and they had been tending to their father's animals that they followed into a cave. Emerging out of it, they found themselves in Woolpit. The sun does not rise upon our countrymen. Our land is little cheered by its beams. We are contented with that twilight which among you precedes the sunrise or follows the sunset. Moreover, a certain luminous country is seen not far distant from ours and divided by a very but considerable river. Shortly after this description of a non-existent land, Richard took the children to be baptized in a local church. However, the boy died very shortly after from an unknown illness. The girl known as Agnes grew into adulthood and married. She remained private and spoke little to many. And so the secret of their original homeland died with her. Children's Crusade is number five. Joining where the wild things are and labyrinth for most bratty and annoying kids is a boy in some stories named Stephen, who claimed to have been given a divine message from God to go forth and conquer the world. He was 12. Anyways, Stephen approached many royals looking for resources only to be turned away. He even asked for the support of King Philip of France who very rationally told the kid to go back home before bedtime. This was directly after the Holy Land Crusades, so it was mainly due to the fact that they believed he wanted to live out a hero legacy like his idols because he was 12. Like prepubescent boys, Stephen wasn't going to drop it when told no. He instead started preaching and recruited a band of faithful children to lead them into the Holy Land. One day, having found someone to supply his large gaggle of children, reportedly over a thousand, with a boat, Stephen loaded everyone up, unarmed and unprepared, and took to the seas. They were never seen again. It's believed Stephen's ship sank or the children were stolen by the ship crew and brought to Egypt for other unfortunate purposes. No matter what happened, the preachings of Stephen led to what's believed somewhat between a thousand and ten thousand children to their demise. Stephen is one of few documented children crusaders, none of which can technically even be labeled as a crusade because to fall under that title, a mission had to be delivered and blessed by a pope. No children's crusade was ever approved. Speaking of holy crusaders, the fate of the Templars is number four in our countdown. Founded in 1118 as a monstatic military, their duty was the protection of pilgrims as they traveled to the Holy Land following the Christian capture of Jerusalem during the First Crusade. The Knights of Templar quickly became one of the richest and most influential groups of the Middle and Dark Ages, erecting banks, castles, and churches. Their wealth would be their downfall. A secret letter detailed black magic and scandalous sexual activities that was sent through France. The reality of this document was that it was made by King Philip of France, who notoriously stole and plundered from anyone he could. In response, more than 600 Templars are arrested, as well as hundreds of non-warriors who handled the day-to-day -day work such as banking, farming, and organizing. The men were charged with a wide array of offenses including heresy, devil worship, spitting on the cross, homosexuality, fraud, and financial corruption. The Templars, meanwhile, were kept in isolation and fed meager rations, all while facing brutal torture. Given the extreme conditions of medieval methods, it's not a surprise within weeks, hundreds of Templars just confessed to false charges. Their lands and money were confiscated and officially dispersed to another religious order, the Hospitallers, although greedy Philip did get his hands on some of the cash he coveted. Didn't know this guy was real, but the Pied Piper is number three. The proof is etched in the Hamlinia face itself, an inscribed plaque on the stone facade of the so-called Pied Piper's house dating to 1602 reads, AD 1284, on the 26th of June, the day of St. John and St. Paul, children 
children born in Hamlin were led out of the town by a piper wearing multicolored clothes. After passing the Calverly near Copenburg, they disappeared forever. The tale, in fact, has survived a very long time. Originating as medieval folklore, it inspired the Grimm Brothers legend, The Children of Hamlin, and one of Robert Browning's best known poems, The Pied Piper of Hamlin. While there are some small differences in the stories, the basics remain the same. The piper was hired by the people of Hamlin to rid the town of rats. Trailing after their hypnotic notes, the rat catcher and his magical flute made them go to their demise. But when the town refused to pay the piper for his service, the savior came for Hamlin's children. Entranced by the notes of his magic flute, the boys and girls followed the piper out of town and simply vanished. So what happened to Hamlin's children? One theory is that the Pied Piper played the role of a so-called locator or recruiter. They were responsible for organizing migrations to the east and they were said to worn colorful garments and played an instrument to attract the attention of possible settlers. Popular opinion is, if this is the case, the children may have been taken to the Berlin area, as the family names common in Hamlin at the time show up in surprising frequency in areas of Uckermark and Prisnik, near Berlin. An entry in Hamlin's town records dating 1384 laments that it's a hundred years since our children left. The stained glass window in town St. Nikolai Church, destroyed in the 17th century, but described in earlier accounts, reportedly illustrated the figure of the Pied Piper leading ghostly white children away. And St. Anthony's Fire number 2 in the countdown is not as cool as it may sound. When people of Paris were tormented with painful boil sore swelling and the sensation of fire in their skin, the only cure seemed to be a trip to St. Mary's Church in Paris. There, Duke Hugh the Great nourished the ill with his holy grain stores, said to help the ill recover. And they did. But as soon as they returned home, they had the plague again with terrible illness. The cause? St. Anthony's Fire. The disease starts with faint burning in the skin. Soon red spots covered the infected person's body who felt like their limbs were on fire. Arms would swell and turn bright red, then terrible hallucinations would plague them, convincing them they were being assaulted by demons or dragged to hell. Finally, gangrene would set in and the victim's fingers and toes would drop off one by one. Once infected, few survived. So what caused this horrible disease and why did Holy Grain cure it? Well, if you've seen our video Top 10 Unusual Events from Medieval History, you may know about ergot poisoning. It's a fungus that grows on rye during cold and damp conditions. When the grain is ground up and then made into bread, people consume the fungus and poisoning ensures. So do cues stores of holy grain were better maintained because of his status and they weren't contaminated with ergot. When people ate his grains, their ergotism went away, but as soon as they returned home and they consumed their contaminated grains, they were poisoned again. Ergot would remain undiscovered still for years to come, and many forms of ergot poisoning would manifest in this time. Number one takes the video title seriously though, The Dark Age. It's said the ninth plague of Egypt was complete darkness that lasted for three days. Well, this may not be entirely wrong, with the exception of it actually being eight 18 months. In 536 AD, it said a huge portion of our world went under a dark, mysterious fog that fell on Europe, the Middle East, and parts of Asia. The fog blocked the sun during the day, causing temperatures to drop, crops to fail, and people to die. As a result, countless documents were found in this country of mysterious darkness. However, they weren't taken seriously until the 1990s when researchers in Ireland noticed the rings on the inside of trees indicated some funny business around 536. Summers in Europe and Asia became 35 Fahrenheit to 37 Fahrenheit colder, China even reporting summer snow. They realized that the ancient witnesses were really actually onto something. They weren't being hysterical or imagining the end of the world. Now researchers also discovered what may be the main source of the darkness. A volcanic eruption in Iceland in early 536 helped spread ash across the northern hemisphere, creating a fog and altering the global climate patterns causing years of famine. With this realization, accounts of 536 become real horrifying real fast. I mean, put it in perspective. One day the world is plunged into darkness and then the sun just never rises again. In primitive times especially, this seemed to have a traumatic effect. We marvel to see no shadows at our, of our body at new, wrote Cassiodorus, a Roman politician. He also wrote that the sun had a bluish color and the moon had lost its luster and the season seemed to become jumbled together. So in at number 10, we have witch marking. I'm trying to avoid some things we've already covered in similar videos, so while we've discussed witches, let's talk about witch marks. So during the English and Scottish witch hunt days, there was a belief that witches always had a natural skin mark. This could be a mole or a scar or a pock mark or even a really bad zit. So when they came across a woman whom they thought were a witch, but she didn't have any of those markers, that was the end of it, right? She isn't a witch? Well, no, they gave her a skin mark instead, specifically by using a pricking needle, which the witch hunters would carry. These needles repeatedly prick the flesh of the accused used until it produced the result that wouldn't bleed but was insensitive to pain, which fulfilled the criteria of a witch's mark. It's a 
subtle punishment for something that they were yet to be accused of, because by giving them the mark, they could now accuse them. These witch hunt days were a whole mess. Number 9 is marking your territory. Not in a cool, sexy, I got a tattoo way, more in a scarlet wetter kind of way. As you'll learn in this video, a woman who cheated or even was single and just engaged in intercourse of her own free will could be classified as a sinful adulterer and cheater and be punished, usually a lot worse than a man. So when Nathaniel Hawthorne wrote The Scarlet Letter, he took inspiration from real life events. The letter, which for the character Hester Prynne was just a red A, was usually the letters AD, which stands for adultery, as outlined by the Plymouth Colony Law in 1658. Multiple accounts across Europe verify that someone who has been marked was to be seen out in public without it, could be subject to public whipping and other public humiliations that ensured a person's social alienation. Like in the Scarlet Letter, when Puritan minister Arthur refuses to admit his sinful side of the act with Hester, he's branded with an A in his chest. In a man's case, while this was of course painful, it was allowed to be hidden. He also didn't have to face the societal consequences the way any woman would have. For number 8 we travel to discuss status degradation. While it still persists today, not everyone knows what it means. So essentially you do something wrong, oopsies, you lose some of your basic human rights. You could steal something, have relations out of wedlock, cheat on your partner, miss some work. Every empire that has used this tactic has had a variety of ways that you could mess up and receive this punishment. Naturally, in times where a woman was property and couldn't buy things, own things, or do things, or breathe without having a man side eye her for it, this was a monumental punishment to receive. Under the Roman Empire Augustus, who reigned from 27 BCE to 14 CE, a woman guilty of adultery could lose several rights as a citizen and suffer a financial burden. Noble women in the Kingdom of Korea during the Chosan Dynasty faced a similar degradation of their societal status if they were found guilty of remarrying as a widow. This intentionally made it hard for Korean women to remarry as they would have nothing to offer a new husband, no inherited lands or funds, and a societal belief deemed her as used goods. Even the descendants of widows at the time who had remarried faced status degradation. They were barred from ever holding office. Adulteresses in the Chosan were stripped of many of their rights and privileges once they were demoted to low born statuses. As serious as these punishments may seem, some high status women who committed adultery in the Chosan dynasty faced an even graver punishment, which was death. So why take someone's status from them as a criminal punishment? Well, because aside from the fact as a woman you'd essentially be left jobless, homeless, and without any family, it's because of a cheater's fama, number 7. While fama is a Latin term for reputation and good name, every country had its own version of this fama. And if you cheated, or were even just accused of cheating in 13th century France, which by the way happened a lot because husbands just want to get rid of their wives, the woman was always the center of the punishment, even if that was the man who had been cheating. This is because the status is all a woman ever had for a very long time, and the name of her family's reputation laid on her shoulders, thus all that pressure to be religious, virtuous, and most importantly, a submissive woman. The customary laws of Agen province list public humiliation for both the wife and her lover as the appropriate punishment for adultery. If the man could escape before or even after arrest, he could get off without any punishment and his partner had to face her punishment alone. The woman got no such reprieve, even if she was just the mistress he cheated on his own wife with. In fact, if she tried to escape arrest, it warranted a death sentence. Women whose fama suffered through public shaming walk of atonement were no longer deemed honorable members of society, and seeing as damning of individuals before law at the time was often based on their reputations, what others thought of them, and how they behaved in public, she'd be left, as I said, homeless, familyless, and dejected. For my Game of Thrones people, think Cersei. Number 6 is no protection. Get your mind out of the gutter. That's not what I'm talking about. I mean there's no protection from capital punishment. While civil laws were easier to work around by just getting married alone, you can borrow money or property, you can buy things that you couldn't before and sign contracts, the criminal law didn't bend to a married woman, as she faced the same penalties as an unmarried one. Now, there are technically one exception, pregnancy, but only because it could potentially be a boy, which is insane. Additionally, all women were exempt from certain torts, such as the breaking wheel. But man, when a woman got capital punishment, it was the one and only form, and it was the most brutal and painful one, burning at the stake. By the way, they claim this was the only and the necessary option of execution for a woman, as it's a preservation 
execution of female modesty. Apparently other forms of execution were unbecoming of a woman. Although there may be some truth to this wild justification, modern historians have rounded it down to just misogyny, as well as a deep-rooted suspicion and dislike of women as the root of this execution decision. Essentially, when given the opportunity to punish a woman, men went ham for it and wanted to see her suffer as much as possible. So women experienced the worst executions of the Dark Ages. Number 5 is why women want to stay in religious favor. In medieval Europe, a device was literally invented for women who defied their religious beliefs. Pyramid shaped and made of wood, the woman who dared to defy her god should fear this. See, they would bind the woman's hands and ankles and then sit one of her two genital openings on the peak of the pyramid. She would then be incapable of shifting her weight anywhere else and was forced to put her weight down on the tip. It would slowly slide upwards and inwards and the longer she was pressed down on it, the more her body split apart. These women would be left for days on end sometimes on this device. The device's slow, agonizing death can be compared only to the shame it inflicted as well. The woman was stripped nude and forced to suffer this torture in public for all to see. Number 4 is harems. To start, the word harem is derived from the Arabic word harim, and it often means sacred, forbidden, and sometimes sanctuary. This was an accurate name as only women's household members and some related male members were allowed to enter a harem, which was an honored women's space. The harem was the ultimate symbol of a sultan's power, his ownership of women women, mostly slaves, was a sign of wealth, power, and sexual prowess. The seclusion from public gaze also inflated this power more so. But a royal harem could be a place of filth and stink where chaos and emotions ran high. This was the price of being property. Used by the emperors and his sons, you could either be favored or so hated that one day you vanish and rumors of your exile whirl amongst your peers. These ladies usually did not have the liberty to move out of the harem as they liked, but inside the harem they could move around as they pleased. There was no sisterhood in them either. Socializing amongst themselves was usually not friendly and jealousies were shown directly. Makes sense, as status and position of authority in the harem were determined by the place that they had in the emperor's favor, and to give the king his first male child was a great competition in this regard, resulted in unpleasantness through the royal harem. Everyone tried their best to please the emperor and turned her bad qualities like jealousy, aggression, or short-tempered attitude onto other women. Seeing as many of these women were stolen from outside the empire, let alone inside, frustration with language barriers and culture clash was also a huge source of contempt. Sometimes the women would lie to the sultan to have others disposed of, or they'd simply gang up on one another. Regardless, harems were places of drama, inequality, and a race to be favored as a ticket out of sexual servitude. Hidden sexuality is number three. There were plenty of mainstream laws in medieval and middle Europe against male homosexuality, and while it wasn't considered as serious, lesbianism still posed a threat to the ideals of a male-centric societal order. A law written in 1260 France stated that women caught in engaging in homosexuality, she'll undergo mutilation on her first and second offense, and on her third, she must be burned. This is one of the only laws to specify consequences for lesbianism, but the 13th century and Christian perspective of sex radicalized further into modesty. Lesbianism was equated to sodomy at that time point and therefore carried a similar sentence, death. There is sufficient evidence of lesbians in middle ages, most of which come from the church. Turns out many nuns were sexually active lesbians and the church directly acknowledges their presence by having to pass laws establishing penalties for nuns caught having sexual relations with each other. So not only were they having sexual relations with each other, but it was enough that the church had to do something about it. For example, during the 8th century, Pope Gregory III gave penances of 160 days for unnatural female acts. Still, no torture or death though, this is because as long as phallus or other phallus shaped objects weren't used or involved, the relationship wasn't considered real intercourse. Real intercourse involved procreation after all, so eventually when Christian Christianity up the ante, however, any sexual act that caused pleasure, which now included lesbian intercourse or plain old self-stimulation, was now considered sin. So like most women of the Middle Ages, even bisexual and lesbian women had to settle down for a man at that point. Anyone who struggled with sexuality can imagine how dreadful it would be to live that way. Divorce was a nightmare, which is why it's number two in our countdown. Laws worldwide were unforgiving of divorces, literally always to the woman. In Chinese laws, a woman could only divorce her husband if he missed treated her family, not even her. He, on the other hand, could divorce her for anything. Some accepted grants for divorce were failure to bear a son, evidence of being unfaithful, lack piety to the husband's parents, theft, suffering a virulent or infectious disease, jealousy, and talking too much. A pretty superficial list, but in Chinese 
society, divorce was a serious action with social repercussions for both parties, so consequently divorces were not as common as they may sound. She could not be divorced if she had no family to return to or if she had gone through the three year mourning period for her husband's dead parents. And speaking of family, during the Han Dynasty, unmarried women brought a special tax on their family and women with babies were given a three year exemption from the tax and their husbands a one year. So there was a huge push to get married. Meanwhile in medieval England, their similarities are stark. They too had a small number of divorces despite an expansive list of reasons to do so, such as there was a discovered blood relation between the individuals, or impotence, or fear used to obtain consent, marriages entered into under false pretenses, things like that. In many of these cases, the lack of sufficient evidence made them difficult to prove and thus deterred people from taking their cases to court. And number one is the tradition of foot binding. It existed for around 10 centuries, and there are women alive today who still have feet that are the result of feet binding. Foot binding involves systematically breaking the feet and shaping them inwards. This tradition started in the Five Dynasties Ten States period of the 10th century, when beloved concubine of the emperor built a gilded lotus flower stage and performed a dance on bound hoof shaped feet. Being a beloved concubine, the other concubines of the emperor attempted to imitate her feet to curry his favor. So foot binding began within the royal court and spread through China as the next fashion fad. It's done in a ritualistic ceremony accompanied by a variety of traditions to ward off any bad luck. They began by tucking the toes under the feet and using a long, tight ribbon wrapped up to the ankle to hold it all in place. Anytime the foot grew, they broke it inwards more, a process usually taking two to three years. The foot would remain bound for the rest of a woman's life. There is a whole list of issues this caused. Outside of extreme agony and being a handicap, it caused some women pain for the rest of their life. Their walk was changed, as was their posture, and the idealism of a slim body to lighten the pressure on one's feet was all the rage. The binding of feet actually caused the women to develop strong muscles in their hips, thighs, and buttocks, so much that the characteristics were considered physically attractive to Chinese men of the area, aka the girlies were thick. When colonization came to China, western women boycotted foot binding, going as far as to catch women with bound feet and cut off their bindings. A humiliation because these women would never ever show their bare feet to anyone, let alone even husbands. And many of these women lost their husbands when the western boycott worked. A lot of girls who had had their feet bound in order to become marriageable suddenly found themselves abandoned by their husbands because foot binding was no longer fashionable at all. Rome really had existed as nothing but a name by the time the empire falls on September 4th of 476, having been falling inwards on itself for just short of a century at that point. So started the periods between the 5th and the 15th centuries known as the Middle Ages. This time can be split into three main sections, the Early Middle Ages, aka the Dark Ages, High Middle Ages, and Late Middle Ages. One of the most famous events from the entirety of the Middle Era was truly kicking some ass in the Dark Ages, and it was the Black Death. Something that nobody gets anymore, with exception for a cool 20,000 some odd people between 2000 and 2009, and 56 people in the United States in the last few years. But if we pretend that we don't know that, and if we can avoid chipmunks like the effing plague carrying hair bringers of death they are, then we most likely don't have to worry. But travel back in time, say to the 800s or even 1340s Europe, and your chances of surviving are somewhere between 7 and 10 and 2 and 5. Black Death killed as much as 60% of the entire population of Europe. So when you're at work looking around but with those blank dead fish eyes bored, cross off every third person you see in a pattern of 5 and try to figure out how many of them are gone and who you'd manage without. Probably now being in a position to go, hey boss, looks like you need new middle management team and ain't since nobody left, hooray, promotion. That's exactly what happened in the middle ages too, after half the world died, kind of changed the balance of power. Suddenly peasants could ask for pay raises and improvements in working conditions and life got a little better for them. This was further developed by the evolution of feudalism. And as a result, the first banks and widespread money supply appeared for the first time in Europe. RIP freedom, hello capitalism. And speaking of the workforce, how about their dirty jobs? Knight, tosher, rat catcher, oh my, there's no shortage of terrible jobs in the dark ages. So let's cover a few. So a leech collector was a woman's role. She was often living in the countryside near marshes and bogs, just generally dirty open water spots where she could strip her legs bare, grab 
grab a bucket and wade into the mud, waiting for leeches to sucker themselves on. At that point, she could scrape the buggers off, bucket them, and then sell them in town to physicians, the wealthy people, beauty stores, whatever. Enjoy the scabs and infectious diseases. The groom of the stool was a position for the royal household, who was in charge of cleaning the king's badunkadunk, making sure it was clean and dry post his kingly, well, dumps. Tanning leather seems like it would just be hard. Don't worry, on top of stripping animal skin of its fur, soaking it, and consequently yourself in lots of lime and salt, it also involved animal feces. See, you'd hire this other guy who somehow had a worse job than you, he's called a pure collector. He'd collect you dog poop, you'd grab it with your bare hands and mush it into leather to treat it. And don't get started on lime burners or treadmill operators, which was essentially a 50-50 death sentence job. And usually whatever job you ended up with was one for life, because chances are you stay in one place. Many people dream of traveling, my generation especially is one that's opting out of children in order to do so. This isn't new, and the human desire to travel and learn is something inherent, coming with curiosity and the need to discover. But this wasn't one of those times. Written records show that a sizable proportion of people not only didn't travel to other countries, they never even left their region or the village they were born in. Even if you did manage to travel, it wasn't planes and annoying but passable airport waits. The average traveler would often sleep out in the open air. Inns or other forms of accommodation were few and far between, and usually too expensive for the typical person to afford. So aside from the super fun chance of freezing to death overnight, travelers in the Middle Ages also had to worry about being robbed or attacked on the road. Many people therefore chose to travel in groups, but even then you weren't entirely safe, your homies could turn on you at any second. Consider also that roads and pathways were rough, and this was a ridiculous era where even spraining an ankle could prove to be fatal. Then there's finally bridges, which are quite rare, especially outside of big cities, so you might have to cross rivers manually, and while they could memorize and recite Latin every day, these dummies couldn't swim. Drowning was all too commonplace, even the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick I died while attempting to cross a river. So if you're gonna live in one region, one city, and one house your whole life, naturally it would be a dingy shack. Because peasants' homes were small, often just made up of one room. They were constructed of wattle and daub, a type of method of constructing walls, in which vertical wooden stakes, or wattles, are woven with horizontal twigs and branches, and then daubed with clay or mud. Then they'd have a thatched roof to boot. And if they're well constructed, these bad boys could be waterproof and stand for a decent amount of time. But they required upkeep, and not everyone can afford that, especially seeing as it's essentially paper mache twigs and mud, you really had to stay on top of this. Inside of a hut, a third of the air was penned off for animals which lived inside with the family. I know people that complain about the smell of a cat litter box. My guy, you could have had a whole donkey living next to the kitchen sink. Chickens, cows, pigs. Then to really complement the mildew smell of rotting roof and the stink of sweat and feces covered animals, a fire burned in the hearth in the center of the hut so that the air was permanently eye watery smoky. Furniture was maybe a couple stools, a trunk and bedding, and a few cooking pots. Beds were a thing, but they weren't very great. And don't forget a couple of dirty chamber pots kicking around the room. We may have discovered a new homing style, you guys. We could call it medieval open conceptualism with minimalism aesthetic. And when it's time to get your kid out of the house, you hook them up with an apprenticeship. The freaky Greekies weren't the only ones tossing their kids at other adults saying, here, take this and raise it. However, unlike the Greek apprenticeship, which came with some strings attached, as explained in the recent top 10 reasons why living in ancient Greece was impossible video, the dark age apprenticeship was truly and solely about work. But nobody said it was good or fair work. From the midpoint of the Middle Ages onward, master craftsmen were permitted to employ youngsters for free so long as they provided them with food, lodging, and formal training in their specific craft, which would undoubtedly elevate their status in this society. But getting through an apprenticeship was hard as hell. First, nobody said the food had to be quality, so rations often sucked and apprentices could effectively starve. But then there was the fact you could just get beat up by your master at any time, because it was literally expected of them to do that. Why? Because apprenticeships were ways of parents to get crappy, troublesome teens out of the house and learn some discipline in society. To add insult to injury, apprentices were stuck between childhood and adulthood by being teens. Because on one hand, a teen in medieval times would have been treated as an adult. On the other hand, privileges of adulthood, like the right to inherit money or ownership of land, didn't come into play until around age 21. So you're expected to be an adult, treated like a kid. Small wonder then that the tales of apprentices misbehaving badly are a staple of written accounts from the Middle Ages. Rather than dedicating themselves to their professional development, apprentices would often be 
found in pubs and brothels. Normal middle aged teen activity. And having a crappy kid sucks even more so back then than now because of the baby gamble. Choosing, if a woman got to choose, to have a baby was a hell of a decision in the dark ages. Plagues, famines, messed up weather, just not the environment for it. Let alone women being regarded as morally weak and they weren't allowed to do things that modern women take for granted, like getting a job, deciding who to marry, having opinions, wearing pants. Your only two options were to become a nun or marriage. No work, no single living in the country, you get two options. And even if you weren't the most devoutedly religious, nun was safer, if not a better option. Childbirth and pregnancies would kill one out of every three women in the dark ages. Compare that to today's maternity morality rate as one out of every .028% of women. The fact that the female population now is significantly more equal in numbers to men in comparison, I think the choice is spectacularly easy. According to the Raven Report, childbirth in the Middle Ages and the Tudor period were so dangerous, royal women were encouraged to write out their last will and testament well in advance to giving birth. Just imagine adding that to the baby to-do list under decorate nursery and sew onesies. But on the flip side, some men weren't exactly capable of popping out babies, thus the impotence trials. Modern time has counseling, understanding doctors, and little blue pills. All sorts of resources to help men with that issue. But the Middle Ages? Whew, don't expect any real sympathy. Not from wives or the whole community. Conjugal duties are taken hella seriously. Partially because everyone was frisky and they're locked into having just one person for the rest of their life. And it wasn't just men who had the right to ask their partners to perform. Wives could also demand intimacy and failure to provide? Well, buddy, you're getting served. And many recorded cases of women being granted divorce due to their husband's infancy exist to prove it. And they were carried out in public. Whole Judge Judy style throwdowns to called impacy trials where accused man was expected to um, perform in front of the jury. To be granted a divorce, the woman had to prove her man was unable to perform, which wouldn't be shocking when you have an entire village watching with bated breath, even if it wasn't an issue before. Don't worry, a dude could save himself the shame of an annulment by calling on special witnesses such as working girls or other women from the past who could attest his manly prowess. Any medieval lady capable of putting her husband through such a humiliating ritual was almost always from a wealthy family. Lawyers and expert physicians didn't come cheap, but at the end of the day, men were literally able to cut our faces off in public or throw us in a fire alive for not baking bread rice, so guys, I don't really think you can complain about this too much. Laws like this are one of the many stupid details that could have you randomly imprisoned. Another one, stingy stripes. Living in the dark ages is impossible for a lot of reasons, but having to keep track of hundreds of stingy laws to ensure you don't get locked up over a mistake truly was one of the hardest factors. What was the wrong way to pray? The wrong hair? A mole in the wrong spot? A color only the king can wear? Or how the simple act of wearing stripes could lead to your imprisonment or even death? Why? Because for some reason, striped clothing were seen as a garment of the devil. Thus, anyone caught wearing them would at best get an evil eye from people in the street or at worst get a hemp necktie. From the year 1250 onwards, the only people who were caught wearing stripes were the lowest of the low in society. Working girls, handicapped, the ill, the orphaned. They would don striped outfits highlighting their status as outsiders. In 1295, Pope Boniface issued a papal decree banning religious orders from wearing any type of striped clothing. In the year 1310, in the French town of Rouen, for example, a local cobbler was condemned to death simply because he'd been caught wearing striped clothes. Crazily, even animals weren't exempt. Records show that zebras were called beasts of the devil, even though people in Europe had only ever heard reports of them and hadn't even seen one with their own eyes. You can see how these guys led to colonization, right? Ridiculous. With the dawn of the Enlightenment in Europe, the hatred of stripes eased and eventually disappeared, and many look on the phenomenon with confusion, and understandably so. Time for the Shrek references. It's ogres and pitchforks. More specifically, just the pitchforks, and less specifically, really just the farm tools in general. You guys know in the movies like Shrek when the villagers all come carrying pitchforks and farm tools and of all things, like why that and not swords? First of all, swords are heavy and who has that kicking around? Seriously. Secondly, noblemen could require all male peasants over the age of 18 to report for military service. Didn't matter if it was a justified war against a viable external threat or just a petty fight against a local rival. If you are called up for duty, you had to report. According to histories of the time, around one in five peasant men would be in a military service. Food and clean water were in short supply and disease was rife. Some historians reckon two thirds of all conscripted men who died were killed by unsanitary conditions of their own camps over any enemy action. But peasants were required to bring their own weapons. Moreover, they would rarely receive anything more than rudimentary training, so they're sent to war unprepared and ill-equipped. Thus the thought process, well, if this tool works on my farm, for this, it'll work 
for that. So uh, what really sucked about military service in medieval times is how little was in for it for you. These days joining the military can be a way of learning a trade or generally improving your lot in life. Not so back then. Feudal lords were fearful of their peasants getting too powerful, so you're once a farmer you're staying one. If a peasant soldier got too skillful on the field of battle, there were several cases of them ending up mysteriously dead. It's like getting a journalist of the year award from the CIA. And finally, it wasn't just living that was impossible, but death sucked too. Alright, so evidently whether from this video, others, or general universal knowledge, Dark Ages was pretty grim reality to live in. It's short, dirty, desolate, and brutal. But when it wasn't short, it was somehow worse. See anyone over the age of 50, which was a crazy age achievement at the time, was deemed elderly. Unlike other cultures existing at the time, elderly in Europe are not even close to revered or respected. You didn't get to retire, having to pay your own way and continuing to work until physically you simply couldn't. Then, yeah, after that you're really just a burden. Your own kids are side eyeing you and everyone's asking you why haven't you haven't died yet. What's the big hold up here guys? For many, death was the only real chance to escape from everyday hardships or working the fields and trying to get enough money and food to survive. And when that finally happens and you pass through and rejoin the energies of our earth, you will finally find your peace. Yeah, no, psych, that still didn't happen. According to some research in Europe during the Middle Ages, mass of 40% of graves were disturbed. Now this wasn't like grave robbing during the enlightenment. There were no university medical schools paying good money for fresh corpses to study. Rather most cases of grave disturbances were run of the mill theft. Often people would be buried with a small selection of their possessions, perhaps a favorite cup, a locket, a stuffed animal toy, or other such trinkets. In tough times, even some dead person's mystery grave junk might be enough to tempt a broke thief to dig someone up. However, this wasn't always the case. There's some even weirder crap too. Archaeologists in England have found evidence to suggest that in dozens upon dozens of quote grave robbing cases, rather than looking for objects, those responsible bound and gagged the dead bodies and then left them like that. It seems like they're fearful of restless souls or perhaps of the undead rising again. Who knows, they had a lot of problems back then. Number 10, beauty sleep. When you go to bed at night, ideally you want eight hours. Me personally, I'm lucky if I get like six. I don't know, I'm like a child. I'm restless at night. I'm kicking around, I'm making weird noises. It's insane, it's problematic. Maybe I should see someone. If this were medieval times, however, I'd be set. See, back in the dark ages, it was common to have two four hour naps at night rather than one swift eight hour slumber. See, many believe this was to tend to a fire or hopefully not a fire. You know, gotta wake up, make sure things aren't gone. It's medieval times, it was rough. You wake up, throw a log on, yawn, and then hop back into your pile of hay. I don't know, whatever they had back then. Good times. This system of waking up after four hours, it sounds like an unhealthy inconvenience, but in reality, historical accounts suggest that people in the dark ages generally really slept for longer periods of time, despite their sleep being interrupted by periods of wakefulness. They slept longer due to the fact that, you know, light bulbs didn't exist yet, so lava lamps weren't a thing, neither were alarm clocks. So people would often go to bed shortly after sunset and wake up with the sunrise, so that's a good rest. That's a good medieval rest. That's like 12 hours. Number nine, the Norse disappearance. I just watched the Norseman. I'm gonna start barking at people now when I'm on the subway, just to, you know, get my old roots back, my old Norse roots. There are several theories regarding the disappearance of the Norse from Greenland during the Dark Ages, right? Where did they go? Where does a Norse Viking go? That's a little concerning. Where'd that guy go with the beard and the hatchet? That's a little important. One theory suggests that climate change played a significant role. A little ice age, which began around the 14th century, that led to a decrease in temperature and a shorter growing season. Of course, making it difficult for the Norse to farm and raise livestock and, you know, have that big mighty beard and eat good. This could have resulted in a decline in food production leading to famine and ultimately the collapse of Norse settlement. Another theory suggests that the North were on the North, the Norse, the North of the North. Another theory suggests that the Norse were unable to adapt to the harsh conditions of Greenland. The Norse were used to living in more temperate climates and the extreme conditions of Greenland could have been too difficult for them to endure. They're a little too hot for comfort. Finally, there's a theory that the Norse were driven out by the Inuit who had been migrating into Greenland around the same time as the North. So a little bit of a beef happened there, a little West Side Story with Vikings, if I may. The Inuit were skilled hunters and fishers, and their presence could have put pressure on the North Settlement, ergo war. But it's likely that the combination of these factors contributed to the disappearance of the North altogether. So exact reason, that's uh, still a mystery. I vote the Inuit though. There's probably some beef. There's probably some settlement beef. Number eight, green children of Woolpit. Now this one, this is a medieval story that tells the tale of two children who randomly appeared in the village of Woolpit in England, but they showed up with green skin. 
and they spoke an unknown language. So aliens confirmed, for sure aliens. I wouldn't even open that door. The children were taken in by a nice local landowner, and although they were initially very distressed and refused to eat any human foods, they eventually adapted to their new surroundings. Again, green children didn't speak English. Aliens, reminder. The boy eventually learned to speak English over time, and he explained that he and his sister came from a land where the sun does not shine, and everything was green. Yeah, it's like Avatar 3 going on. Something's going on out there. Sometimes the grass is greener on the other side, but sometimes the people are also green. That's fun. That's a fun little bit. Bunch of incredible hooks in a place where there's no sun. Sounds nice and warm and welcoming. Lovely. Let's find out more. The origins of the story, of course, remain a mystery with various interpretations ranging from folklore to my personal favorite, extraterrestrial encounters. Love aliens. Love that. Grew up watching signs. You tell me in the comments. Did this happen? Are these aliens? Were these just random children? Children? This is all bullshit. Who knows? Number seven, Shroud of Turin. The origins of the Shroud of Turin, a piece of cloth that bears the image of a um, one Jesus Christ, a crucified man, shrouded in mystery, it seems. According to tradition, the shroud was used to wrap the body of, again, one Jesus Christ after his crucifixion, and many Christians believe this right here to be the burial cloth of Christ. I pointed like I actually have it here. I don't have it here. I wish I did. That would be great. We get a lot of likes, but no, it's over there. However, its authenticity is the subject of ongoing debate, of course, because I mean, who really knows? The shroud first appeared in historical records in the 14th century, and it's been housed in Turin, Italy, since the late 16th century. Again, that's a pretty mighty piece of cloth right there. Next national treasure, Nicholas Cage has to grab that and put it in his pocket like a cowboy. Number six, John Cabot's fate. John Cabot, he was an Italian explorer who sailed under the English flag, and he's known for his voyages to North America in the late 15th century. His final voyage in 1497, this was intended to establish English trade and settlements in the New World. But Cabot, he set out with a small fleet of ships from Bristol, England, and he sailed along the eastern coast of North America. However, something happened. He encountered difficulties, I guess one could say, including rough weather and a mutiny among his crew, which is much worse than a storm, I would say. And his fate remains unknown to this day. That rhymed, Dr. Seuss, love it. Some historians believe that Cabot may have perished at sea, while others speculate that he may have made it back to England and then died there. So how did he go? Was he eaten? Who knows? Who really knows? Number Five, the plague. Yes, we just lived through one of these. That's in the, isn't that neat? Can't wait to tell my kids about that one. Plagues are everywhere throughout history. Some are short, some are impossibly incredibly long. The bubonic plague arrived to medieval England in 1348. Now the death toll here, it was devastating. I mean, we put up some crazy numbers in the last few years, don't get me wrong, but in the dark ages, the bubonic plague took out almost half of England's population. That's insane. They didn't even have Uber back then. You're like, how, how did that happen? Back then the plague was a bacterium now known as your Pestis. Symptoms were jarring to say the least. There were lumps in the armpits and or um, you know groin area. Not fun. Black spots would appear all over your body. It was uncomfortable and it was noticeable definitely to say the least that you were plagued out. Almost all that were infected died within three days. More often than not without a fever. Just randomly. Boom. Done. The drop in the population resulted in a widespread of wealth. That's uh, I guess a bright side. Not really. Workers were demanding higher wages. Farmers were demanding lower rents and the poor got expendable income. Sounds a little familiar, dare I say. Number four, Greek fire. One's absolutely crazy. Greek fire was a weapon used in medieval times. It was particularly used by the Byzantine Empire and it was known for its ability to burn even when submerged in water. Yeah, almost like magic, some would say. Some scary, hot magic. The composition of Greek fire was a closely guarded secret, but it was known to be a highly flammable liquid that could be projected from tubes onto enemy ships or soldiers. So yeah, they would just blast liquid lava at you. And then they're like, yeah, war's done. Just like that. Like in Game of Thrones where it's just green fire. It was kind of like that. Greek fire was often used in naval battles and set enemy ships ablaze in four minutes or less. And its use was a significant factor in the success of the Byzantine Navy. The exact ingredients and recipe for Greek fire, like I said, they have been lost to history. And its composition remains a subject of debate and speculation among historians. Let's hope we don't find this one. I don't know. Let's find some pharaohs, mummies, tombs, treasures. That's great. Some guys like, oh, the recipe for liquid lava that we can shoot at people. Awesome. Let's do it. Number three, the Vinland Mountain. 
map. The Vinland map, this one's fun to all the toptographers, portographers, toptographers, map people. This one's for all the map fans out there. The Vinland map is a medieval map that depicts parts of North America, including a region known as Vinland. Not to be confused with Vineland, that's pretty good, I, that's a fun one. Vinland is believed to have been visited by the Norse explorer, Leif Erikson, around the year 1000. Now the map was first discovered in the 1950s and it's believed to date back to the 15th century. Buster rhymes, I'm like, huh? However, its authenticity has been the subject of ongoing debate among scholars and historians because, you know, it's like Atlantis. Some have argued that the map is a forgery while others believe that it's a genuine medieval artifact, like the Shroud of Turin with, you know, Jesus' selfie. This is amazing. I have to say, I believe this was once a real place. Sure, why not? The amount of pharaohs and leaders, dictators, all these people throughout history lost in books that have been burnt. Of course, there are places and maps that have also been lost to history. Or maybe I've watched too many national treasure movies. Could be, could be the latter. It's probably that too. Number two, the dancing plague. All right, this one's fun. Hit that like for Step Up 2 fans. This one's gonna be real sick. July 15, 18, one of the most bizarre dance circle slash plague events, who knows really, in medieval history went down. It was the craziest dance circle all of history, I have to have to admit. The dancing plague. Yeah, why can't this be the plague that comes back now? Why, it had to be the one that was gross, everyone's coughing on each other. Why could we all just be popping and locking in the streets in 2020? Would have been way better. The town of Strasbourg was calm, cool, and collect one summer, back in 1518, until out of nowhere, one woman began to dance, or convulse, uncontrollably in the streets. Others soon joined her, which is the weird part, and eventually over 400 people were all dancing the days away, or convulsing, one of the two. It's really tragic. See, this was not a good time. It's, you know, we call it the dancing plague. You're like, oh, they were all dancing in the street. No, it was a nightmare. People are like seizing on the ground. Seizing? Seizing? People are seizing on the ground. It was tragic. A good amount lost their lives due to pure exhaustion alone. The authorities, they tried their best to help out the situation. They uh, they paid for musicians to perform for them while they convulsed, which is just the thing you need back then. They're like, oh my god, what's happening? Quick. They just played music. They're like, this makes it way better. This is so fun now. No, it was horrible. Everyone was sick. This was a disease. This happened a few times in Europe, believe it or not, between the 14th and 17th centuries, and we still don't know what exactly happened. All we know is that it was some sort of illness and that it was not like step up two. Apparently it was not sick, nor 3D, nothing like that. And finally, number one, no insults. This one here is great. This would change the game today. If we brought this one back, so good. I can't whistle, but It'd be like that. If you hurled insults at somebody back in medieval times, they were entitled to compensation and they could summon everyone else who's around at the time to be a witness. Yeah, if you spoke bad of someone during the Viking age, even if the person wasn't there, it could ruin their reputation. And because of that fact, you now need to pay them for the possible damages you caused with your words, with your sick, nasty words. It doesn't even matter if the insult was true either. The reputation was how you gained employment back then, how you met friends, and it was really important. It was an important thing not to be messed with. Also, if you insulted one man, apparently you insulted his entire family as well. So it's like that Vin Diesel kind of fast and furious families everything vibe where with one person, they're all coming at you. It was rough. There were some words, however, where a man would be allowed to kill you if you said it. I don't even want to know which words that was. Sometimes you went a little too far spreading lies, so they had to make it a capital punishment. Now, thou shall not talk smack. Get out of here. Number 10, trial by jury. The concept of trial by jury can be traced back to ancient Greece and Rome. Don't get me wrong, that's old school. But the first recorded use of a modern jury system, that dates back to the 12th century England. Medieval England, yes, let's get some men in a room and point at witches. Henry II introduced the practice to replace previous methods of trial, which at that point was relying on physical combat or divine intervention, all that kind of like that. Under this new system, a group of 12 men from the community would be chosen to hear evidence and determine the guilt or innocence of said accused. Right? A little better. A little, you know, less witchcraft, more, okay, we're all talking now. We're conversing. This system gradually spread throughout Europe and then beyond, so on, and Danforth, and it became an important cornerstone of many modern legal systems. Back in the day, this was a noble deed. It was an honor to be part of the jury, you know? Today, not, not really so much. Not the same at all. You're like, what? No, I don't want to do that. It's gonna take so long. It's gonna be like four weeks of jury duty. I haven't done it yet. I've just jinxed myself. I'm gonna get called any day now. Don't answer, you know what I mean? Just don't answer your mail. Don't look, just avoid it. That's what I do. Number nine, the stocks. All right, relax, stock bros. I'm not talking about those stocks. I'm talking medieval stocks. Those ones are 
A bit different. Those ones were very bad. Those are all bad. The stocks were a common form of punishment in medieval times. The convicted person's ankles were locked into these wooden boards with holes for their feet and stuff, and their hands were sometimes also restrained. We've seen this before. Usually people are like this. You go to a theme park, you pose with your family in one of these things, they're like, hey, I'm stuck. You're like, get me out, this is scary. They would be left in public spaces like that, such as the marketplace or town square, anywhere public because, why of course, you know, shame, shame, we gotta shame everyone back then. And if that wasn't bad enough, the accused would then be pelted with food or even physically attacked by the crowd. Imagine that, imagine being so sparse for food and you're like, yeah, let's throw our bread at that guy. It's like, what, what a waste, we need that. The duration of the punishment is varied, but it could range from a few hours to several days. Yeah, locked up like this for days at a time. What a joke. It was used for various crimes, theft, drunkenness, and slander. And it was intended to humiliate and shame the offender while also serving as a deterrent to others. Guys like, oh, I'd hate to be that guy over there. Yeah, for sure. All right, let's throw food at him now. Sick, so dumb, so dumb. Number eight, the drunkard's cloak. Yeah, this one's uh, quite funny. Not really, but we'll see. The drunkard's cloak, also known as the barrel or the shaming cloak, again, shame, shame, big important step back there. This is a humiliating punishment used in medieval times for people who were drunk or disorderly in public. This person, this drunk person, they were forced to wear a large barrel or a cloak made of wood or heavy cloth, something big and obvious with holes cut out for their heads and arms. Like they're a big mascot, a big barrel mascot in medieval times. And sometimes they would have offensive messages or images painted on it. You know what I mean? Like the piece of paper that says, kick me. That was like the old school version of that, much worse. The person would then be paraded through town in this garment, this outfit, this big barrel and not fun, often with crowds throwing garbage or food at them. You know, that kind of medieval Game of Thrones stuff. This punishment was intended to publicly shame the person as well. So yeah, shame and then we'll go into the rough nitty gritty stuff at the end here. Number seven, eavesdropping. Eavesdropping back in the day. I mean, today we've all done it, right? We've all listened at some point in our lives to somebody we don't know. Every time I hear somebody in our hallway, in our apartment, I have to look, right? I'm like, who is it? Someone breaking in. But if you did it during the dark ages, if you listened in on a conversation you weren't supposed to hear, well, there were some serious consequences that were waiting for you. Eavesdropping was considered a serious crime back then. That's why they're always whispering in Game of Thrones. Now it makes sense, right? The act of secretly listening in on someone's conversation without their knowledge and or consent while this crime was viewed as a breach of privacy and trust. <sighs> How dare thee? It was often associated with other crimes such as treason or espionage. This was a big bat. Espionage? Are you kidding? Just because you heard someone say something? Get out of here. Punishments here could include fines, public humiliation, classic, imprisonment, or yeah, remember what happened to Littlefinger in Game of Thrones? Not great. There's worse stuff that could be done. Yikes. Horrible. Number six, Pacific hunting. Yeah, you gotta be sure which, uh, where you throw an arrow back then. In medieval England, the hunting of the king's deer was considered a very serious crime. Yeah, not that deer. That one's fine, but just don't you hit that one. Mm -mm. The act of killing or even injuring a deer was punished harshly under the royal forest law, which was enforced by the king's foresters. That'd be a cool job, just rolling through the forest looking for people. The law applied only to the king's forests, which were areas of land set aside specifically for hunting for his food. Violators could be subjected to a variety of punishments, including fines, imprisonments, and even mutilation. Yeah, a little different than public humiliation. It's just mutilation this time. This law was meant to preserve the deer population for the king's personal use and enjoyment and serve as a way for the monarchy to maintain control over the forest and the resources that it provided. So if you want food, go to that forest over there. It's not even a forest, it's like a marsh. It's horrible. It's like three frogs left. Good luck. Number five, heretic's fork. Yeah, a lot like this. This one sucked. The medieval heretic's fork was a device used during the Inquisition to punish individuals accused of heresy. You hear the wrong stuff and then you say the wrong stuff. No matter what you do, bad punishment awaits. Some fork's going in a place you don't want it to be. This punishment consisted of a long metal fork with two prongs that were placed under the chin and the sternum of the accused, making it so you had to stay upright or else, yeah, not good. The device was designed to keep the person awake and prevent them from speaking and or swallowing, and if they do so, it would cause extreme pain. The prongs here could be adjusted to vary the amount of pressure applied, and the device was often left in place for hours or, again, 
then, like the other punishment, even days at a time, which is horrible. The heretic's fork was cruel and it was a form of psychological punishment that was used to extract confessions and punish those who dared to speak out against the church. Yes, how dare thee? Now hold still. Number four, sewer surfing. Uh, it's not as cool as you're imagining, but it's something along those lines. Also known as sewer hunting and or draining, sewer surfing was a popular but illegal activity during the Dark Ages and involved navigating through the underground sewage systems of cities, typically for thievery or other illicit activities, trying to find some gold, something, I don't know, something shady going on under the city. Sewer surfing was often punished severely, more than you'd think here. Guys going through garbage, they're like, ah, hang him. It's like, what? It was also considered a violation of the law and a danger to public health. You go down there, you come back up with, I don't know, a plague that you found down there? You don't want that. You don't want a rat to bite you. Offenders would face fines, imprisonment, or even the gallows. However, despite the risks and penalties, many people, many people, continued to participate in this dangerous activity as it was their only means of survival or adventure, or money or goods or anything really. It led to numerous arrests and punishments throughout the medieval period. Honestly, Fair, I don't know, you never know. Somebody may have lost a nice pocket watch or maybe you'll find rats and then get really sick. 50-50. I found a pocket watch. Also, the town is violently ill, so I'm rich, sorry. Number three, blasphemy. Blasphemy! You almost have to yell it every time you say it, you know? Blasphemy was considered a serious crime in medieval times. It involved speaking ill or speaking contemptuously about God, Jesus, and or the church. That's a big no-no back then, big no-no. This was seen as a direct attack <laughs> A direct attack to God and the faith. It was considered a threat to the very fabric of society just because you said some sh Blasphemers could be punished in various ways. At this point, you probably know them. Imprisonment, flogging, and or, well, yeah, just you're dead now. In some cases, offenders were forced to wear a blasphemer's bridle, which was a metal mask with a spike that was inserted into the offender's mouth, which would, of course, prevent them from speaking more. Blasphemy laws varied across different regions and periods throughout medieval European history, but they all shared a common goal of protecting the sanity of religious beliefs and shoving metal into a human's mouth. All those things were very important to the faith. It's good stuff. Number two, beard tax. I tried to grow a beard for like two weeks and I just, I just immediately bailed on the whole thing. I was like, Hey, you'll see me guys, I'll show you. And then I came back, didn't even talk about it. In medieval times, I would have been fine. Honestly, this is a, it's a weird tax. There were periods and regions in medieval history where facial hair was regulated and or frowned upon. Imagine that, right? Guys trying to grow it out, a little, has a little stubble. Everyone's like, ugh. Really, Alexander the Seventh? Really? During the reign of Henry the Eighth in England, a beard tax, a beard tax, cha-ching, was imposed to, well, only men with beards over two weeks old. They were required to pay. If you were day 13, they're like, all right, we'll see you tomorrow. You better figure it out, figure this whole thing out, mister. Vikings, however, what about them? In the Dark Ages, Vikings, they were all about the beards. What happened? Beards, when it came to Vikings, they were highly valued and considered a sign of masculinity and strength. Again, I'd be screwed if it was that time. I'd be good over here, but then I'm a very weak man over here. Know what I mean? No tax and then no muscle. Taylor McWaters, no tax and no muscle. Huh. And finally, number one, not reporting a dead body. Yeah, we've all seen Stand By Me. This can lead to some problems, some troublesome things. This last one here is pretty obvious in theory, but the way that they handled it back then was pretty crazy. We're not doing it the same today. Thank God. Thank the church and the lords. In medieval times, roughly around 1240, the law surrounding the discovery of a dead body, ha, huh, surprise, what's this? Who is this? This varied depending on the region and the time period. But generally, if somebody discovered a, huh, who is this uh, skeleton? What's this? Generally, at that time, they required to report it to the courts or the lords. The lords. You know the lords. Go tell the lords. Failure to do so could result in punishment, as, of course, it was considered suspicious behavior. Fair. Okay, fair. More often than not, the person who found the body, they would be asked to provide information about the circumstances surrounding the death, including any and all possible suspects. Yeah, so, uh... Take a guess. He had wood teeth, he looked old and medieval. I don't know, he was someone. In some cases, the finder may have been entitled to a reward for discovering the body, but in other cases, you yourself could be charged with the death. So, 50-50, might get some money, might go to jail. If that was me, I'd be like, nope, I didn't see a thing, sir. I was just looking up at space, wondering what that big rock in the sky is. I don't know what gravity is. All women are witches, right, brother? Cheers, <laughs> didn't see anything. With scalps so oily, they could star in grease. It's no wonder lice was everywhere. You know what? 
I will give them a little bit more credit. It is true after a certain point of not using shampoo, even the straightest of thin hair can regulate its oil levels. So their scalps probably weren't the worst, but maybe they were rocking some hella dandruff. Also, as I mentioned, lice. Say you're somehow living a medieval life healthily, being whatever you are in the castle. You're making a living, you're not sick, and nobody wants to tie you to a chair and dunk you underwater. Even if you've managed that, you still have lice. Bugs were everywhere, man, all kinds of them. On you, in your room, in your food, nowhere was safe. Lice was such a way of life that people treated appointments to get deloused in pretty much the same way people treat appointments for a haircut today. Maybe an exaggeration, but you get what I mean. People in the Middle Ages and medieval times took lice to their grave, living a life of itch, 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 itch. No one likes having rats and mice in their house. Unfortunately for castle dwellers, the dark, cold living quarters within the castle afforded the perfect breeding ground and lifestyle for plenty of rodents and bugs, carrying diseases that could have meant the end for any of the castle's residents. Name something grosser than a non-ventilated stone behemoth full of unwashed bodies. So why no washy-washy of the body body? Why is that so difficult to accomplish? Jump in a river or something, right? Wrong. Leeches, disease, death. Also, hot baths are preferred. Regular and incredibly convenient bathing as we know it today did not exist in Europe until the late 19th century, so Europeans in the 13th, 14th, and 15th hundreds were not vibing with that idea. Firstly, water was precious, especially during sieges, and the work was so hard and manual and labor intensive that you would build up a sweat the moment you got out of the bathtub. So bathing was seen as a waste of time. I mean, wash off two weeks worth of grime and one little batch of sweat made that a waste. Your bath water's probably brown, dude. Still seems kind of worth it, but secondly, the trouble of setting up a bath just didn't seem to be worth it. No running water, so if you wanted a hot bath, you had to boil the water yourself over a fire, carry hot water buckets upstairs to the bathtub, fill the bathtub and not spill the hot water on yourself, get the temperature right, put the soap in if you had any, get in, wash before it cooled, get out, dry, put your clothes back on, and then you have to bail out the entire bathtub by hand with a bucket and find a window to toss the water out of onto some unsuspecting servant. So yeah, it was a lot of work. And what a feces, what do these highly civil highly sanitary individuals have to offer us for the call of nature. The modern toilet didn't exist back in the 14th century. Instead, you either had a closed stool, which was a special seat with a bucket underneath, or you used a privy, which is a seat with a hole in it. So why not call them the same thing? Whatever, medieval people. Waste going through the closed stool, which by the way is where we get the feces nickname stool, was collected in the bucket, which was then removed, emptied, washed, and replaced. Waste that passed through the seat of a privy, which was was the early kind of toilet ended up in one of two places. If the castle had a moat around it, the waste probably would have gone in there. If it didn't have a moat, or if the privy was located somewhere without access to water, bodily waste ended up in a cesspit at the very bottom of the castle. But anyways, check out what some of the privies looked like. From what I gathered reading, there really were some castles without designated rooms for these. Just could find them in random hallways in case you want to whip it out and take a leak right there. At Paravril Castle, you often find privies high up in the wall, high above the smell, and safe from attackers who might use the literal crap hole to get into the castle like a reverse Shawshank escape. The most famous example of this allegedly took place during the siege of Chateau Galliard in 1204. Talk about a crappy job, it's the royal bleep shoveler. You know the word, it rhymes. So, cesspit, the medieval crap dungeon thing. Though medieval people didn't know about germs, they believed bad smells caused illnesses, meaning when the stank started wafting up a little too hard, one unfortunate man would have to clean it out. Like rich people now days scheduling a maid, whenever this dude showed up, everyone in the castle would hightail it out so as to not have to interact. The gong farmer would shovel the poop into baskets and wheelbarrows and take it off to bury or spread on fields as fertilizer for the food they ate. Gong farming could be dangerous. In 1325, Richard the Raker fell into a cesspit and drowned. Say goodbye to sinus and sense of smell as the acids cook that out of you. And stay away from the infectious bacteria literally everywhere. However, gong farmers were quite well paid despite people not wanting to ever get close to them due to their smell. Rest assured though, because castle logic was that closets and toilets are one of the same. The private castle privy was always sharing the same space as the residents stowed away personal belongings and a room called garter robes. Obviously, you can see this is a stepping stone to a wardrobe being a sequestered small offshoot room. Inside the garter robe was also a toilet hole next to your Sunday best. Logic dictated clothes should be kept close to the toilet to prevent insects 
from damaging them. The idea being that the odor would act as a deterrent for insects. Fecal odor, okay. And what makes all of this so much better is that you never have a second alone. If you haven't caught onto the theme here yet, it is plain and simple. Castle life meant cramped quarters. It took a lot of people to keep a castle running. There were cooks, cleaners, guards, personal servants, and of course, all the royalty as well. Plus, the royals that lived in the castle extended past the nuclear family. It was their extended families as well. As a result, most of the rooms were multifunctional and the keep was the primary living space in the castle. Soldiers, servants, and even lords and ladies in waiting were expected to sleep in groups segregated by the sexes. For example, the women may have slept in bedchambers while the male servants, courtiers, and soldiers may have slept in the great hall. Even lords and ladies of castles often shared a room with a servant of the same sex. So why is that gross? Religious and royal obligation to reproduce. Also people without an obligation who would really like to do it anyway. As long as those people are married, you actually couldn't complain. In fact, it's weirder if you saw something and said something. So if everything stinks and you got next to no windows, how do you make a minty fresh castle? The simple answer is they didn't. Mold, insect, vermin, and disease were all part of everyday life in medieval times. Fresh water was precious and a reliable disinfectant was yet to be discovered. Eating a little bit of mold on your food or stepping in rooms with moldy walls were minor problems compared to actually finding enough food to eat and fighting off hungry wild animals like wolves or not dying of the plague or not being accused of witchcraft, there's bigger fish to fry. People in Norman and Tudor England lived short lives. If you reached the age of 40, you were considered old. Castles were very difficult to keep clean. There was no running water, so even simple washing tasks meant carrying lots of bucketfuls of water from a well or a stream. Few people had the luxury of being able to bathe regularly. The community back then was generally more tolerant of smell as a result. Inside the castle walls, floor coverings consisted of straw rushes and later sweet smelling herbs like lavender and mint. This could be swept away and replaced when it was of a noticeable point of filth. It was said that an ancient collection of beer, grease, fragments, bones, spittle, excrement of dogs and cats, and everything that is nasty was seen when the soiled herbs were swept up and exchanged for fresh ones. But you know what doesn't help a castle? The smell of rotting corpses. Ah, luxury. There are heads of enemies cooking in the sun on spikes right outside your fresh air slit. There's the remains of a peasant shredded by mad dogs dogs in the courtyard below, and someone is literally rotting just to your left in the wall. Castles were riddled with the dead. In the case of an oubliette, they were quite literally riddled. An oubliette is basically a little coffin cave thing dug into a wall, where a particularly hated prisoner could be tossed in, bricked up, and completely forgotten about. Fittingly, oubliette comes from the French word oublier, which means to forget. Given some of the other medieval death options, I guess starving to death, bricked into a rat infested hole wasn't the worst way to go. It's it still was way creepier to think that on any given day a castle had people rotting in its figurative basements and walls. Must have been for great ghost stories though, not great for the smell of their decomposing body quite literally wafting up through the floorboards later. Next up is how horrible it would have been to be a lady on the rack. So ladies have periods and they need some way to handle the men's seas mess without the feminine hygiene products we have today. This ain't the Victorian era where it was commonplace to weirdly free bleed everywhere. Medieval women preferred one of two choices. She could always catch the flow after it left her body or find a way to absorb it internally. In our modern words, medieval women could use a makeshift pad or a makeshift tampon. Pads were made of a scrap fabric or rag, thus the whole on the rag thing. Cotton was preferred because the material absorbs fluid better than the alternative wood, which not only repels liquid, but it's itchy and uncomfortable. Whether they made the choice of a homemade pad or homemade tampon, medieval women worried about leaks and stains. This is the main reason why red was a popular medieval petticoat color. The scarlet color was not only fashionable and decorative, but functional to disguise leaks. Now, the period ain't what's gross, it never is. It's what wealthy castle dwelling women could afford to block said period that was gross. A common type of bog moss found throughout medieval England, Sophagon simophilolian, was a remarkably absorbent material. Ladies stuffed their homemade pads and tampons with it, and folks even used it as toilet paper or as battlefield dressing. The popular name 
name for this moss is blood moss. Entomologists contend that this moniker comes from its use in battlefield first aid. This account, of course, oozes heroism and masculinity. In reality, it earned the name from being used in menses and shoved up there. And definitely my favorite on the list today is protection wasn't just armor. One of the most interesting castle finds includes the protection discovered in Dudley Castle in 1885. Dating from the early 1600s, they're the earliest definitive physical evidence of the use of animal membrane jimmy hats in post-medieval Europe. The enact deposits uncovered during excavations contained both domestic and organic remains of the occupying royalists who defended the castle under siege between 1642 and 1646. The keep's latrines had been sealed during the demolition of the castle's defenses in 1647. Examining further, scientists were able to determine that five blackened jimmy hats had been used and a further five non-blackened ones were presumably unused, all folded in on one another. The Department of Scientific Research at the British Museum boasts that their significance was magnified due to the nature of the find and the extraordinary archaeological cir circumstances in which they were found. Who might have used them is unknown, however the complexity of the manufacture must have made them relatively expensive, so perhaps the preserve of an officer class. It's known that officers wives were present during the royalist occupation, however this discovery definitely testifies this was neither the time nor place to pop out a kid. Stay safe and use protection y'all. Number 10, duels. The Dark Ages, yeah, a lot of fun. Hope you're prepared at all times to defend your home, your family, and your honor. Good luck, you get a really sh sword as well. Break a leg or two. Medieval duels were a common spectacle among men. It was a means to settle disputes and display bravery and stand like this and talk like this, of course. Dressed to the nines in armor and tights, knights clashed on horseback and on foot, wielding swords, maces, and shields. I wouldn't be able to carry any of those. My arms would be shaking just trying to hold a shield. They're so heavy. They're so impossibly heavy. These intense one-on-one -on -one bouts were governed by strict rules, often overseen by heralds or nobles. Ah, uh, yes, our noble Joe Rogan will oversee this bout. Now bump fists. Ping. Duels showcased a knight's honor with victory bringing respect to the land. Yeah, you gotta bring that respect back to your land or else you're not coming back to that land. The outcomes impacted social standing and reputation. While duels had its risks, it was an integral part of medieval culture. So go support your medieval times dudes. Go eat some chicken and watch an $80 show. They're pretty fun. I haven't been yet. Number nine, falconry. This one's pretty bad. So when you think of the dark ages and the jobs that were available, we often forget about this one. This one's pretty cool. Falconry was a popular pastime among noblemen during the medieval period and involved the training and hunting with birds of prey, such as falcons, but also hawks. But hawkonry doesn't sound as cool, so we gotta say falconry. Rolls off the tongue. Rolls off thy tongue. These noble hunters formed a deep bond with their feathered companions through meticulous training. Now falcons, prized for their speed agility, and keen eyesight, these were used to pursue and capture smaller game. Falconry served as both a prestigious sport, but also a practical method of acquiring food because, well, Uber didn't exist back then. But you know what we had? A guy with a falcon that we can trust. A scary man with a falcon who'd walk around and, and grill you all day. Number eight. Tights. I don't know why I said it so angry. I'm like, tights. In medieval times, men wearing tights was a fashion trend that reflected social status and style. I got a pair of tights for running, and I'll be honest, I've never felt more like a knight in my entire life. Pull them up tight as a knight. Let's do this. Tights were originally worn for practical purposes, like keeping warm and having an ease of movement, of course, but tights gradually became a symbol of high fashion among the upper classes. Of course. Can we do that with sweatpants now? Can we? I feel like we're close. They accentuated the physique and showcased a man's wealth and refined taste, you can say. Sure, we'll get onto that in a little bit. Yeah, all of that in one pair of tights. How lucky were we? Tights were often brightly colored, sometimes even covered in fun patterns. They're your tights. You're living in them. Get creative. Why not? This fashion statement eventually influenced modern day styles. So next time you see a jogger, just think of the noble knight right there running to his next bout with his water belt. Number seven, cod pieces. Since we're talking about tights, let's talk about what we stuffed inside said pants said pantaloons. In medieval history, cod pieces were a peculiar fashioned accessory, trend, whatever. They were worn by men. Now these padded or stuffed coverings were designed to protect, but also emphasize the groin area. And it got really stupid. They really got carried away with it. It became a joke almost immediately. Originally serving a practical purpose, cod pieces eventually became exaggerated and decorative, symbolizing masculinity. Again, 
all while wearing tights, which is so funny. What a sight to see. Some guy wearing like the biggest cup you've ever seen. And you're like, this isn't cool. You don't look like a really cool guy right now. Why is yours so bumpy? You should go see the local barber and get that checked out. Uh, their size and prominence varied over time with some, of course, reaching comical proportions, covering them in diamonds, studs. Like, you know, it doesn't look, that doesn't look good, man. Hashtag not hot. Get out of here. Number six, public bathing. Bathing establishments such as a bathing house or a communal tub, these provided a place for men to gather and cleanse themselves. It was so disgusting. Now you think guys are gross now in the washroom and whatever goes on in there. Back then these gatherings were considered a social gathering where men would interact, relax, and discuss various matters. Official means, okay? Watching a guy wash his behind while he's pitching you a beard tax. You're like, okay, sure, perfect place for a meeting. Let's do it. Mind if I cover up first? Weirdo. The act of bathing back then was seen as both a physical and a spiritual purification. Ah, yes, so spiritual. All this is really transcending me. I love it. Let's go home and plan some stuff. While nudity was not unusual back in these settings, modesty was still valued just a smidgen. So individuals would often use towels or cloths for some level of privacy during these meetings. Thank God. How vulnerable is that? Like, hey, any ideas? You're like, yeah, man, I'm naked. Why don't we get dressed first? Here's my idea. Number five, arming squire. Being a knight, obviously it sounds cool. They have the sword, the horse, the flowing hair, whatever. They're saving the damsel in distress. Sometimes they lose a hand like Jamie Lannister. Spoilers, you had 10 years. But that's just what being a knight is, right? It wasn't always a fairy tale epic being a knight. I mean, first of all, this process starts when you're young. When you were seven years old, you would be given to a noble to learn for seven more years. And then at age 14, quick maths. At age 14, you would become a squire. A squire is a knight's intern, not an ideal job to have when you're a wee lad, but it's a job in the medieval times nonetheless. Can't complain. Also, you had no choice. Get going. Arming squires, they had a lot of responsibility. Arming squires would repair a knight's armor while they were still wearing it, you know? Which buckle was it? Oh, okay, that one. Ugh, it's pretty wet and damp. Yeah, fixing up chainmail on a grown man's thigh. That ought to suck, welcome to the dark ages. Also after these epic messy battles, arming squires would have to clean everything off their armor. Everything, yeah. A lot of yuck, and this was long before Dawn soap was ever a thing. So they had to clean with urine. Yeah, it gets worse and worse, doesn't it? Welcome to medieval times, moving on. Number four. Jesters. The earliest account of the fool, they go back to the 11th century. Now these fools were hired to liven up the party. Most of you may have an image of a jester in your head, jumping on tables, telling jokes, farting on your aunt and uncle. It's pretty accurate. That was his job. Pretty cool. It was one of the best jobs to have, all things considered back then, this title of a minstrel or a fool. It was an honor to have. The fool's payment was also no joke. Roland Le Pature, he was rewarded with 30 acres of land from King Henry II. As long as he showed up to court every year on Christmas Day to fart around. Literally, he would whistle, jump around, and actually fart. And in doing so, he had acres of land. Guy was loaded, because he was just farting on people. Imagine eating beans on Christmas Day, having a nice time with your family, and then Roland jumps on the table, starts farting on your grandma, then he leaps back over to his mansion. I hate this, I hate the dark ages. Let's move on, I'm getting angry. Tell no one. Number three, groom of the stool. Nowadays, higher ups in the office, they have assistants grab your coffee for you, maybe they answer some phone calls, keep the business running while you're off golfing. You know, whatever you wanna do. Assistants are vital. The groom of the stool, that was a bit much when it comes to assistants. So what did their assistants? We have some labor laws put in place now that I don't think we're gonna see an online job opening for a groom of the stool anytime soon. But hey, who knows? Fingers crossed. I'd love to see this again. That's pretty funny. Back in the dark ages, this role was vital and respected. It was created by King Henry VIII. Now this role was to assist the king, specifically to assist his bowel movements, his activities, his big old king <sighs> sessions. You had a box that you had to carry at all times. Now that was where um, all the magic happened in said box, the dark magic that is. And you would literally follow the king around until he needed to use this box. Cause porta potties weren't a thing back then and there's no way you're gonna catch a king squatting in the woods so now we're here. Now this is your job. In fact, you won't even find that king wiping his own behind. That chore was also reserved for the groom of the stool. You're probably thinking, Taylor, which poor soul had to be stuck with this role? A prisoner? Somebody who lost their sense of smell, hopefully, ideally? No, only sons of noblemen could take on this role. And in doing so, they also gained access to every room, tons of clothes, and any bedchamber furnishings in a castle. And of course, high pay, thank God. Okay, maybe I would do it, that's not bad. Would you wipe an ass? 
for a castle, Chris? Probably, right? Not bad. You wipe your own for, you know, for no, for no castle. So that's fine. We can get you a castle. Number two, dentist, barber, surgeon combo. Get three appointments in one, all in 10 minutes or less. How lucky are you to be alive in the dark ages? Back then, dentists were not a thing. You weren't gently encouraged to floss more. You didn't have a fun chair that went back real slow, but they did have solutions. They had one solution, and that was to pull everything. Cavity, gone. Toothache, see you later. Maybe you accidentally bit a rock, you chipped a molar, eh, doesn't matter. We're gonna pull it all regardless. They would only pull your teeth out. Barbers were responsible for cutting hair, pulling teeth, and bloodletting. I'm like, perfect, I need all of those today. What are the odds? They would use tools like forceps, pliers, and scraping instruments, all to address dental issues. However, and believe it or not, their practices lacked advanced techniques and understanding of modern dentistry. You don't say. Three jobs in one, yeah, I wonder how long that took to graduate. That's a Hefty program right there. So like, oh, it's 18 years. You're gonna love it. Yeah, no pay. It's good. And finally, number one, the beard tax. Here we go. You may have heard about the cheese tax, but have you heard about the beard tax? This is good. I would have been fine. I really tried earlier this year. Couldn't do it, but I'm bald guy forever. That's cool. I would have saved money in the dark ages. My God, I would have had like savings. Would have been a good, great time. The beard tax emerged in certain regions as a means of gathering revenue and enforcing social norms. Men were required to pay a tax based on the length of their beards and in some cases, even the width or the shape. They're like, we don't like that. Give us $5 right now. Lice infestations were a common problem due to the limited access of personal hygiene and sanitary practices. You know, men bathing together, pitching ideas, didn't help. However, the length and density of beards provided a natural barrier against lice. So it was believed that back then, the oils present in the beard's hair made it difficult for lice to crawl around and survive. Therefore, men often grew their beards as long as they could to prevent lice infestation. That's why Vikings had such big, long, gray beards. I take that back. I actually would have been screwed back then. I would have been so itchy. I'm itchy now just thinking about it. I'm getting out of here. See you. Those are the top 10 unusual things that men went through in the medieval ages. And you know what? Next time I'm going to do women. It's going to be horrible. Witches and just more witch stuff. It's really, it was, it was the worst time. Such as the forbidden omelet. It's not really an omelet, actually. It's more like if you cut a pancake like slab out of the color canary yellow. Back in medieval times, Lent and the other billion days they spent fasting were a miserable affair where Christians ate like lentils and dried fish every day for a month. The English came up with a solution for this tiresome diet the tansy, a sweet and savory dish that was somewhere between a pancake and a vegan omelet. Tansies took their name from the tantatum vulgar herb that grew across the country at that time in great abundance. Eventually a lot more ingredients were added to tansy such as parsley, feverfew, almonds, breadcrumbs, nutmeg, cream, and butter. Ironically, despite the love of tansies and the fact this plant was used to treat medical ailments, it was later discovered to be poisonous. Dangerous to consume, rub on skin, the whole nine yards of poison. Hilariously, that did not stop the English from quite literally driving it to extinction. No more tansies now. And what could possibly be more tasty than something that you can make Make laxatives out of perfume and car oil. It's whale vomit. Amber grease is often considered as one of the world's strangest natural occurrences, and it's been used as an ingredient in food and drink alone for hundreds of years. Europeans used amber grease as medication for headaches, colds, epilepsy, and other ailments. The first reported use of amber grease in perfumery comes from Muslim Spain. It has been used for flavoring everything from cigarettes to Turkish coffee and even hot chocolate. If you like the TV show Bob. Burgers, you may know it from their episode titled as such, where the kids find a big old chunk of it washed up ashore in their wharf town. Something that does still happen nowadays, so keep your eye out for what looks like a giant chunk of earwax at the beach. Formed in the intestinal tracts of sperm whales over decades, amber grease is a grayish brown waxy substance that some scientists believe is produced by whales to help ease the passage of objects they have eaten that they can't digest before expelling the same way whales expel fecal waste. Usually found floating in the sea or washed up on beaches, amber grease has not only been the food stuff of choice for royalty, but it's also been a firm favorite of the perfume industry even today, thanks to its strong and lingering scent. Nowadays, amber grease has fallen out of favor as a food additive, possibly because people found out what it does and where it came from, but it's still used in the perfume industry, apart from in countries where it's banned, such as Australia and the United States. Another absolutely bizarre natural occurrence they enjoyed was the openars, the rudest entry on this list by a country mile. 
Open arses were actually a commonly consumed variety of apple in medieval ages, and they do not look appetizing. What is that? It looks like a Photoshop project of a potato, persimmon, and a crab apple put together. I would say don't judge a book by its cover, but the inside is an effing mess too. Look at that. Who thought that was edible? Who said, look, that looks tasty. Give me a bite. Literally has the composition of a moldy peach. According to the interwebs, the apple got its rather vulgar nickname from its appearance of the underside. The calces, which normally look like this on an apple, are very large, and they're spread apart on an open arse, giving the underside of an apple a distinctly certain exit human appearance. Somehow, looking like that and being still called an open arse, the apple managed to pick up popularity in the 13th century and remain popular for cooking well into the 17th. Dying of fever or just in the mood for an inconvenient hard to cook dish? Well, you may want to consider roast rodent. Those little roly polies, hedgehogs were considered a cure for everything from sore throat to leprosy. Their fat and intestines were considered the most viable. Hedgehogs may seem like an unlikely source of nourishment for us today, not just because of their prickly spines, yet their quills didn't deter determined chefs of the past globally, especially in medieval times when they prepared roasted hedgehogs by gutting and trussing them just like pullets. The hedgehogs were then roasted and then only after they were pressed in a towel to dry and served with cameline sauce or wrapped in pastry and then broiled again. A piece of advice, if, if you're trying to roast a hedgehog and it refuses to unroll, simply take the dead body and put it in hot water. Or at least that's what the recipe books say. It's gross now, it was gross then, but hell do we love it, it's fast food. Stopping for a few minutes to pick up a meat pie for lunch was as common as hitting the drive through today and just as likely to give you diarrhea. Just back then, diarrhea would probably kill you. Fast food cooks were notorious for using diseased or undercooked meat or just warming up yesterday's spoiled leftovers. Again, not very different from what goes on at the back of Taco Hell or Taco Bell. Fast foods of London of the late 13th and early 14th century contained easy, portable foods much like today's Big Mac. Meat pies, hotcakes, tansies, and wafers. These meat pies, called umble pies, consisted of edible entrails from deer or wild animals, generally just scrap meat. These cook shops functioned like medieval drive throughs where customers walked up and put an order at the window. The food was being mass prepared, then individually produced. They toss your little pie in the flames right there, pull her out a second later, and there you go, enjoy your entrails and wheat. In many urban areas, one street became known as the fast food capital for the city. In Bristol, Cook's Row catered to the customers looking for fast, tasty food. As a result of these innovative fast food kitchens, professional cook emerged during the medieval period, employed at the great estates and in smaller shops of urban centers. So they colonized half the world for spices, but aren't the best at using them. It's sugar and spice and not so nice sauce. Spices were stupid expensive because Western Europe isn't exactly known for fiery flora or flavorful plants. And the only real means of transportation tended to die if you rode them too far, horses. So obviously you're just getting rare bits of dried herb brought back from crusades that you also have no idea what it is or how to use. And that's only if you're wealthy too. A lot of recipes described the peasants and even the wealthy seasonings as vinegar, ginger, garlic, chopped bread, unripe apples, and almond milks. AKA most people were limited to flavoring their foods with whatever BS they had lying around. Mostly the tart or sour, leading to the modern British tradition of refusing to eat food that actually tastes like anything. Like spices, sugar was so expensive that it blackened rotten teeth became a status symbol. It was so coveted that when it finally became cheaper and more accessible to the average person in the 16th century, people went nuts. They were rolling meat in it, vegetables, and probably themselves. People tried to liven up their bland ass food with sauces, but the limited access to dairy and tomatoes were still a twinkle in the eyes of the colonizers. And these sauces they weren't the sort of thing you'd want to dip your pizza rolls in as a result. At the beginning of the medieval period, sauces were based on milk or wine or butter, or simply the au jus which emerged as part of the cooking process. Because bread was so important to the overall caloric intake and to maintaining the consistent mold and food poisoning that was killing them all, flour could not be wasted to prepare sauces and gravies, except on the tables of the rich. Their sauces were more like oatmeal, which you'd only serve on vegetables today if you want to ruin them. To give you an idea, one sauce is gruel, it's pounded oatmeal mixed with broth. Oh man, what a treat. Next up is beaver tails, but not the bannock type. Usually saying beaver tail, you think of that sweet, fluffy fried dough covered in sugar, maybe ice cream that's found at carnivals or amusement parks, or that hometown restaurant that sells them for $6.50 even though they're the size of your head. But medieval beaver tail? Whole different animal. Wait, well, whatever. Anyways, as discussed, 
discussed, medieval peasants were fasting like three-fourths of the year. That's a long time. So the church compromised by simply forbidding people to eat meat during fasting holidays and then compromised further by agreeing fish isn't meat. But why stop there? People went even further by deciding certain parts of animals found in water that kind of looked like a fish, like a beaver's tail, counted as fish. Beaver tails were similar in shape to flatfish if you used your imagination. They looked like they were covered in scales and they spent a lot of time underwater, therefore they're actually fish. And they provided a cheap stand-in for the country's fishless poorer masses. But again, why stop there? The 17th century was no longer just the tail that was allowed on fast days, but the whole beaver itself. The beaver was a fish due to the fact it was an excellent swimmer. Unsurprisingly, the 17th century is the same year the beaver goes extinct thanks to overconsumption. Now the beaver is thriving once more again in England, Wales, and Scotland thanks to su successful reintroduction programs from Canada, because we stay carrying that team. A medieval peasant walks into a bar and orders a drink, and has to correct the bartender because they ordered a cock ale, not a cocktail. This hilariously named beer was made by tossing a boiled and crushed dead cockerel with four pounds of raisins, nutmeg, mace, and a half pound of dates inside a canvas bag. The bag was then placed in ale and left there to steep for six or seven days. It was then bottled and kept still for a month, after which ready for consumption. This was the most popular recipe as shared in a 1669 news article by Kelnan Digby. Why was this done to beer when it was already medieval times and it tasted bad enough? Well, it wasn't to produce dead chicken flavored beer, which is why strong herbs were there to overpower the chicken. The reason for ruining perfectly good beer with a giant chicken tea bag stemmed from the belief that the beer would be imparted with the cockerel's characteristics of strength, vigor, and courage. It was therefore mainly drunk by big manly men who wanted to be even bigger and even more manly. It was described as a pleasant drink, said to be provocative, aka it excited lust and aroused the body. In 19th century dictionary slang, cock ale was directly identified as a homely aphrodisiac. However, it naturally fell out of favor eventually for beer that didn't taste like dead chickens. I'm super angry about this one, but apparently it was only done in times of serious famine. It's roast cat. cat Cats were considered highly useful in keeping pests and vermin away. Dogs weren't so much of a commonplace thing, and usually they were the first to be eaten pet-wise when it came to serious food shortages. However, if the going gets tough, you have the option of hunting down some ferals in the woods to feed the fam. So, ever wonder how to roast a cat? According to one medieval recipe, you start off by cutting off the head and tossing it away because it is not for eating. They, for they say that eating the brains will cause him who eats them to lose his senses and judgment. Then you do the cleaning. At this stage, the feline may look ready to roast, but alas, you must first bury it in the ground for a day and a night before you do. Then you unbury it, spit it, roast it, and whip it with a green stick. You can serve the roasted cat by soaking it in broth and garlic. To quote the end of the recipe, and you may eat it because it is very good food, which I feel like they threw in because they knew folks were not sold on eating dead ground food. And of course, what better to end this list than literal garbage, a real literal actual name for a medieval dish. The Historical food blogs are fighting for their lives to try and say this recipe is super tasty. And they've used the old recipe to make it at home. I do not believe you. I will die on this hill. This is probably the worst titled dish in history, and its ingredient list does not improve it. I have found four recipes, and each is just worse than the rest, all going as far back as 1393. So, most generically, you're gonna need all the worst parts of a chicken. You need the head, the, the livers, the gizzards. Throw them into a nice pot. Add fresh beef broth, powdered pepper, cinnamon, cloves, mace, parsley, sage, all chopped small. Then take bread, like actual bread. Just take a whole loaf and just put that in the pot. Boil it, then put it through a strainer, then boil it again. Add powdered ginger, verjuice, which is unripe apple juice, mmm, salt, and a little saffron. Then serve it forth. To have it English style means leaving the pieces of animal and chunks in there. When you serve it, having it French style is to strain it once more and serve it just as a thin broth. Imagine making it brothy soup style, serving that to your buddies before telling them afterwards what they ate.